This is the story of green eggs and yam. You can read along with me in your book. You know when it's time to turn the page when you hear this sound. Let's begin now. I am Sam. I am Sam. Sam I am. That Sam I am. That Sam I am. I do not like that Sam I am. Do you like green eggs and ham? I do not like them, Sam I am. I do not like green eggs and ham. Would you like them here or there? I would not like them here or there. I would not like them anywhere. I do not like green eggs and ham. I do not like them, Sam I am. Would you like them in a house? Would you like them with a mouse? I do not like them in a house. I do not like them with a mouse. I do not like them here or there. I do not like them anywhere. I do not like green eggs and ham. I do not like them, Sam I am. Would you eat them in a box? Would you eat them with a fox? Not in a box. Not with a fox. Not in a house. Not with a mouse. I would not eat them here or there. I would not eat them anywhere. I would not eat green eggs and ham. I do not like them, Sam I am. Would you? Could you? In a car? Eat them. Eat them. Here they are. I would not, could not, in a car. You may like them. You will see. You may like them in a tree. I would not, could not, in a tree. Not in a car. You let me be. I do not like them in a box. I do not like them with a fox. I do not like them in a house. I do not like them with a mouse. I do not like them here or there. I do not like them anywhere. I do not like green eggs and ham. I do not like them, Sam I am. A train. A train. A train. A train. Could you, would you, on a train? Not on a train. Not in a tree. Not in a car. Sam, let me be. I would not, could not, in a box. I could not, would not, with a fox. I will not eat them with a mouse. I will not eat them in a house. I will not eat them here or there. I will not eat them anywhere. I do not eat green eggs and ham. I do not like them, Sam I am. Say, in the dark? You're in the dark. Would you, could you, in the dark? I would not, could not, in the dark. Would you, could you, in the rain? I would not, could not, in the rain. Not in the dark. Not on a train. Not in a car. Not in a tree. I do not like them, Sam, you see. Not in a house. Not in a box. Not with a mouse. Not with a fox. I will not eat them here or there. I do not like them anywhere. You do not like green eggs and ham? I do not like them, Sam I am. Could you, would you, with a goat? I would not, could not, with a goat. Would you, could you, on a boat?
I could not, would not, on a vote. I will not, will not, with a goat. I will not eat them in the ring. I will not eat them on a train. Not in the dark. Not in a tree. Not in a car. You let me be. I do not like them in a box. I do not like them with a fox. I will not eat them in a house. I do not like them with a mouse. I do not like them here or there. I do not like them anywhere. I do not like green eggs and ham. I do not like them, Sam I am. You do not like them. So you say. Try them. Try them. And you may. Try them and you may, I say. Sam. If you will let me be, I will try them. You will see. MMMM. Say. I like green eggs and yam. I do. I like them, Sam I am. And I would eat them in a boat. And I would eat them with a goat. And I will eat them in the rain. And in the dark. And on a train. And in a car. And in a tree. They are so good, so good, you see. So I will eat them in a box. And I will eat them with a fox. And I will eat them in a house. And I will eat them with a mouse. And I will eat them here and there. Say, I will eat them anywhere. I do so like green eggs and yam. Thank you. Thank you, Sam I am. This is the story of the cat in the hat. You can read along with me in your book. You'll know when it's time to turn the page when you hear this sound. Let's begin now. The sun did not shine. It was too wet to play. So we sat in the house all that cold, cold, wet day. I sat there with Sally. We sat there, we two. And I said, how I wish we had something to do. Too wet to go out, and too cold to play ball. So we sat in the house. We did nothing at all. So all we could do was to sit. Sit, sit, sit. And we did not like it. Not one little bit. And then something went bump. How that bump made us jump. We looked. Then we saw him step in on the mat. We looked. And we saw him. The cat in the hat. And he said to us, why do you sit there like that? I know it is wet and the sun is not sunny. But we can have lots of good fun that is funny. I know some good games we could play, said the cat. I know some new tricks, said the cat in the hat. A lot of good tricks. I will show them to you. Your mother will not mind at all if I do. Then Sally and I did not know what to say. Our mother was out of the house for the day. But our fish said, no, no, make that cat go away. Tell that cat in the hat you do not want to play. He should not be here. He should not be out. He should not be here when your mother is out. Now, now, have no fear. Have no fear, said the cat. My tricks are not bad, said the cat in the hat. Why, we can have lots of good fun, if you wish, with a game that I call Up 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 with a fish. Put me down, said the fish. This is no fun at all. Put me down, said the fish. I do not wish to fall. Have no fear, said the cat. I will not let you fall. I will hold you up high as I stand on a wall, with a hook on one hand, and a cup on my hat. But that is not all I can do, said the cat. 
Look at me. Look at me now, said the cat, with a cup and a cake on the top of my hat. I can hold up two books. I can hold up the fish, and a little toy ship, and some milk on a dish. And look, I can hop up and down on the wall. But that is not all. Oh, no. That is not all. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me now. It is fun to have fun, but you have to know how. I can hold up the cup and the milk and the cake. I can hold up these books and the fish on the rake. I can hold the toy ship and a little toy man. And look, with my tail, I can hold the red fan. I can fan with a fan as I hop on the wall. But that is not all. Oh, no. That is not all. That is what the cat said. Then he fell on his head. He came down with a bump from up there on the wall. And Sally and I, we saw all the things fall. And our fish came down, too. He fell into a pot. He said, do I like this? Oh, no. I do not. This is not a good game, said our fish as he lit. No, I do not like it. Not one little bit. Now look what you did said the fish to the cat. Now look at this house. Look at this. Look at that. You sank our toy ship, sank it deep in the cake. You shook up our house, and you bent our new rake. You should not be here when our mother is not. You get out of this house, said the fish in the pot. But I like to be here. Oh, I like it a lot said the cat in the hat, to the fish in the pot. I will not go away. I do not wish to go. And so, said the cat in the hat, so, 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 I will show you another good game that I know. And then he ran out. And then, fast as a fox, the cat in the hat, came back in with a box. A big redwood box. It was shut with a hook. Now look at this trick, said the cat. Take a look. Then he got up on top with the tip of his hat. I call this game fun in a box, said the cat. In this box are two things I will show to you now. You will like these two things, said the cat with a bow. I will pick up the hook. You will see something new. Two things. And I call them thin one and thin two. These things will not bite you. They want to have fun. Then out of the box came thin two and thin one. And they ran to us fast. They said, how do you do? Would you like to shake hands with thin one and thin two? And Sally and I did not know what to do. So we had to shake hands with thin one and thin two. We shook their two hands. But our fish said, no, no, those things should not be in this house. Make them go. They should not be here when your mother is not. Put them out. Put them out, said the fish in the pot. Have no fear, little fish, said the cat in the hat. These things are good things. And he gave them a pat. They are tame. Oh, so tame. They have come here to play. They will give you some fun on this wet, wet, wet day. Now, here is a game that they like, said the cat. They like to fly kites, said the cat in the hat. No, not in the house, said the fish in the pot. They should not fly kites in a house. They should not. Oh, the things they will bump. Oh, the things they will hit. Oh, I do not like it. Not one little bit. <laughs> then Sally and I saw them run down the hall. We saw those two things bump their kites on the wall. Bump. Thump. Thump. Bump. Down the wall in the hall. <laughs> 
SIG2 on SIG1. They ran up. They ran down. On the string of one kite, we saw mother's new gown. Her gown with dots that are pink, white, and red. Then we saw one kite bump on the head of her bed. Then those things ran about with big humps, jumps and kicks, and with hops and big thumps, and all kinds of bad tricks. And I said, I do not like the way that they play. If mother could see this, oh, what would she say? Then our fish said, look, look. And our fish shook with fear. Your mother is on her way home. Do you hear? Oh, what will she do to us? What will she say? Oh, she will not like it to find us this way. So, do something. Fast. Said the fish. Do you hear? I saw her. Your mother. Your mother is near. So, as fast as you can, think of something to do. You will have to get rid of thing one and thing two. So, as fast as I could, I went after my net. And I said, with my net, I can get them, I bet. I bet, with my net, I can get those things yet. Then I let down my net. It came down with a plop. And I had them. At last. Those two things had to stop. Then I said to the cat, now you do as I say. You pack up those things and you take them away. Oh dear. Said the cat. You did not like our game. Oh dear. What a shame. What a shame. What a shame. Then he shut up the things in the box with a hook. And the cat went away with a sad kind of look. That is good, said the fish. He has gone away. Yes. But your mother will come. She will find this big mess. And this mess is so big and so deep and so tall, we cannot pick it up. There is no way at all. And then, who was that in the house? Why, the cat. Have no fear of this mess, said the cat in the hat. I always pick up all my playthings, and so, I will show you another good trick that I know. Then we saw him pick up all the things that were down. He picked up the cake, and the rake, and the gown, and the milk, and the strings, and the hooks, and the dish, and the fan, and the cup, and the ship, and the fish. And he put them away. Then he said, that is that. And then he was gone with the tip of his hat. Then our mother came in, and she said to us too, did you have any fun? Tell me, what did you do? And Sally and I did not know what to say. Should we tell her the things that went on there that day? Should we tell her about it? Now, what should we do? Well, what would you do if your mother asked you? This is the story of Wharton Here's a Who. You can read along with me in your book. You'll know when it's time to turn the page when you hear this sound. Let's begin now. On the 15th of May, in the jungle of Newell, in the heat of the day, in the cool of the pool, he was splashing, enjoying the jungle's great joys, when Morton the elephant heard a small noise. So Horton stopped splashing. He looked toward the sound. That's funny, thought Horton. There's no one around. Then he heard it again. Just a very faint yelp, as if some tiny person were calling for help. I'll help you, said Horton. But who are you? Where? He looked and he looked. He could see nothing there but a small speck of dust blowing past through the air. I say, murmured Horton, I've never heard tell of a small speck of dust that is able to yell. 
So you know what I think. Why? I think that there must be someone on top of that small speck of dust. Some sort of a creature of very small size, too small to be seen by an elephant size. Some poor little person who's shaking with fear that he'll blow in the pool. He has no way to steer. I'll just have to save him. Because, after all, a person's a person, no matter how small. So, gently, and using the greatest of care, the elephant stretched his great trunk through the air, and he lifted the dust speck and carried it over and placed it down, safe, on a very soft clover. Um. Um, the voice. Twas a sour kangaroo. And the young kangaroo, in her pouch, said, Um. Two. Why, that speck is as small as the head of a pin. A person on that. Why, there never has been. Believe me, said Horton. I tell you sincerely, my ears are quite keen and I heard him quite clearly. I know there's a person down there. And, what's more, quite likely there's two. Even three. Even four. Quite likely. A family, for all that we know. A family with children just starting to grow. So, please, Horton said, as a favor to me, try not to disturb them. Just please, let them be. I think you're a fool. Left the sour kangaroo, and the young kangaroo, in her pouch, said, Me too. You're the biggest blame fool in the jungle of Newell. And the kangaroos plunged in the cool of the pool. What terrible splashing. The elephant frowned. I can't let my very small persons get drowned. I've got to protect them. I'm bigger than they. So he plucked up the clover and hustled away. Through the high jungle treetops, the news quickly spread. He talks to a dust speck. He's out of his head. Just look at him walk with that speck on that flower. And Horton walked, worrying, almost an hour. Should I put this speck down? Horton thought with alarm. If I do, these small persons may come to great harm. I can't put it down. And I won't. After all, a person's a person. No matter how small. Then Horton stopped walking. The speck voice was talking. The voice was so faint he could just barely hear it. Speak up, please, said Horton. He put his ear near it. My friend, came the voice, you're a very fine friend. You've helped all us folks on this dust speck no end. You've saved all our houses, our ceilings and floors. You've saved all our churches and grocery stores. You mean, Horton asked, you have buildings there, too? Oh, yes, piped the voice. We most certainly do. I know, called the voice, I'm too small to be seen, but I'm mayor of a town that is friendly and clean. Our buildings, to you, would seem terribly small, but to us, who aren't big, they are wonderfully tall. My town is called Whoville, for I am a who, and we woes are all thankful and grateful to you. And Horton, called back to the mayor of the town, you are safe now. Don't worry. I won't let you down. But, just as he spoke to the mayor of the speck, three big jungle monkeys climbed up Horton's neck. The Wickersham brothers came shouting, What rot? This elephant's talking to who's or not. There aren't any who's. And they don't have a mayor. And we're going to stop all this nonsense. So there. They snatched Horton's clover. They carried it off to a black, bottomed eagle named Vlad Vladikov, a mighty strong eagle, a very swift wing, and they said, Will you kindly get rid of this thing? And, before the poor elephant even could speak, that eagle flew off with a flower in his beak. 
all that late afternoon and far into the night, that black, bottom bird flapped his wings in last flight, while Orton chased after with groans over stones that tattered his toenails and battered his bones, and begged, Please don't harm all my little folks who have as much right to live as us bigger folks do. But far, far beyond him, that eagle kept flapping, and over his shoulder called back, Quit your yapping, I'll fly the night through. I'm a bird. I don't mind it. And I lied this tomorrow where you'll never find it. And at 6.56 the next morning, he did it. It sure was a terrible place that he hid it. He let that small clover drop somewhere inside of a great patch of clovers a hundred miles wide. Find that. Sneered the bird. But I think you will fail. And he left with a flip of his black bottom tail. I'll find it. Cried Horton. I'll find it or must. I shall find my friends on my small speck of dust. And Clover, by Clover, by Clover with care, he picked up and searched them and called, Are you there? But Clover, by Clover, by Clover, he found that the one that he sought for was just not around. And by noon, poor old Horton, more dead than alive, had picked, searched, and piled up 9,005. Then, on through the afternoon, hour after hour, till he found them at last. On the three millionth flower. My friends! Cried the elephant. Tell me. Do tell. Are you safe? Are you sound? Are you whole? Are you well? From down on the speck came the voice of the mayor. We really had trouble. Much more than our share. When that black, bottom bird you let go and we dropped, we landed so hard that our clocks have all stopped. Our teapots are broken. Our rocking chair smashed. And our bicycle tires all blew up when we crashed. So, Horton, please? Pleaded that voice of the mayor's, will you stick by us who's while we're making repairs? Of course, Horton answered. Of course I will stick. I'll stick by you small folks through thin and through thick. Um, um, the voice. For almost two days you've run wild and insisted on chatting with persons who've never existed. Such carrying down in our peaceable jungle. We've had quite enough of your bellowing bungle. And I'm here to state, snapped the big kangaroo, that your sully nonsensical game is all through. And the young kangaroo in her pouch said, Me, too. With the help of the Wickersham brothers and dozens of Wickersham uncles and Wickersham cousins and Wickersham in-laws, whose help I've engaged, you're going to be roped. And you're going to be caged. And, as for your dust speck, ha, ah, that we shall boil in a hot steaming kettle of diesel nut oil. Boil it. Yes, Horton. Oh, that you can't do. It's all full of persons. They'll prove it to you. <coughs> Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor. Horton called. Mr. Mayor. You've got to prove now that you really are there. So call a big meeting. Get everyone out. Make every who holler. Make every who shout. Make every who scream. If you don't, every who is going to end up in a diesel nut stew. And, down on the dust speck, the scared little mayor quick called a big meeting in Mooville Town Square. And his people cried loudly. They cried out in fear. We are here. We are here. We are here. We are here. The elephant smiled. That was clear as a bell. You kangaroo surely heard that very well. All I heard, snapped the big kangaroo, was the breeze and the faint sound of wind through the fat distant trees. I heard no small voices. And you didn't either. And the young kangaroo in her pouch said, Me neither. (laughs) 
Kraven. They shouted. Uncage the big goop. Lasso his stomach with ten miles of rope. Tie the knots right so he'll never shake loose. Then dunk that dumb speck in the diesel nut juice. Horton fought back with great vigor and vim, but the Wickersham gang was too many for him. They beat him. They mauled him. They started to haul him into his cage. But he managed to call to the mayor, Don't give up. I believe in you all. A person's a person, no matter how small. And you very small persons will not have to die if you make yourselves heard. So come on now and try. The mayor grabbed the tom-tom. He started to smack it. And all over Whoville, they whooped up a racket. They rattled tin kettles. They beat on brass pans, on garbage pail tops and old cranberry cans. They blew on bazookas and blasted great toots, on clarinets, boom paws and boom paws and flutes. Great gusts of loud racket rang high through the air. They rattled and shook the whole sky. And the mayor called up through the howling mad hullabaloo. Hey, Horton, how's this? Is our sound coming through? And Horton called back, I can hear you just fine, but the kangaroo's ears aren't as strong, quite, as mine. They don't hear a thing. Are you sure all your boys are doing their best? Are they all making noise? Are you sure every who down in Whoville is working? Quick, look through your town. Is there anyone shirking? Through the town rushed the mayor from the east to the west. But everyone seemed to be doing his best. Everyone seemed to be yapping or yipping. Everyone seemed to be beeping or dipping. But it wasn't enough, all this ruckus and roar. He had to find someone to help him make more. He raced through each building. He searched floor to floor. And, just as he felt he was getting nowhere, and almost shouted to give up in despair, he suddenly burst through a door, and that mayor discovered one shirker. Quite hidden away, in the Fairfax Apartments, Apartment 12J. A very small, very small shirker, named Jojo, was standing, just standing, and bouncing a yo-yo. Not making a sound. Not a yip. Not a chirp. And the mayor rushed inside and he grabbed the yip twerp. <laughs> And he climbed with a lap up the Eiffelberg Tower. This, cried the mayor, is your town's darkest hour. The time for all who have blood that is red to come to the aid of their country. He said, we've got to make noises in greater amounts, so open your mouth, lad. For every voice counts. Thus he spoke as he climbed. When they got to the top, the lad cleared his throat and he shouted out, yap. <laughs> And that yap, that one small extra yap put it over. Finally, at last, from that speck on that clover, their voices were heard. They rang out clear and clean, and the elephant smiled. Do you see what I mean? They've proved they are persons, no matter how small, and their whole world was saved by the smallest of all. How true. Yes, how true, said the big kangaroo. And, from now on, you know what I'm planning to do. From now on, I'm going to protect them with you. And the young kangaroo in her pouch said, <laughs> Me, too. From sun in the summer. From rain when it's fallish, I'm going to protect them. No matter how smallish. <laughs> This is the story of the Lorax. You can read along with me in your book. You'll know when it's time to turn the page when you hear this sound. Let's begin now. At the far end of town where the grickle grass grows and the wind smells slow and sour when it blows and no birds ever sing except an old crows is the street of the lifted Lorax.
Undy, in the Grickle Grass, some people say, if you look deep enough you can still see, today, where the Lorax once stood, just as long as it could, before somebody lifted the Lorax away. What was the Lorax? And why was it there? And why was it lifted and taken somewhere, from the far end of town, where the Grickle Grass grows? The old one slur still lives here. Ask him. He knows. You- <coughs> You won't see the one slur. Don't knock at his door. He stays in his lurkin on top of his store. He lurks in his lurkin, cold under the roof, where he makes his own clothes out of Miff Lufford Woof. And on special dead midnights in August, he peeks out of the shutters, and sometimes he speaks and tells how the Lorax was lifted away. He'll tell you, perhaps, if you're willing to pay. <coughs> On the end of a rope, he lets down a tin pail, and you have to toss in fifteen cents, and a nail, and the shell of a great-great-great-grandfather's nail. <coughs> then he pulls up the pail, makes a most careful count, to see if you've paid him the proper amount. Then he hides what you paid him away in his snuff, his secret strange hole in his gravulous glove. Then he grunts, I will call you, I whisper my phone, for the secrets I tell are for your ears alone. <coughs> Slop. Down slops the whisper my phone to your ear, and the old one slurs whispers are not very clear, since they have to come down through a snurgly hose, and he sounds as if he had smallish ease up his nose. Now I'll tell you, he says, with his teeth sounding gray, how the Lorax got lifted and taken away. It all started way back. Such a long, long time back. <coughs> way back in the days when the grass was still green and the pond was still wet and the clouds were still clean and the song of the swoony swans rang out in space. One morning I came to this glorious place and I first saw the trees, the truffle trees. The bright colored tufts of the truffle trees. Mile after mile in the fresh morning breeze. <coughs> and under the trees, I saw brown varvalutes frisking about in their varvalute suits as they played in the shade and ate truffle of fruits. From the ripulous pond came the comfortable sound of the humming fish humming while splashing around. <coughs> But those trees, those trees, those truffle trees. All my life I'd been searching for trees such as these. The touch of their tufts was much softer than silk. And they had the sweet smell of fresh butterfly milk. I felt a great leaping of joy in my heart. I knew just what I do. I unloaded my cart. <coughs> In no time at all, I had built a small shop. Then I chopped down a truffle tree with one chop. And with great skillful skill and with great speedy speed, I took the soft tuft. And I knitted a feed. <coughs> the instant I'd finished, I heard a gossip. I looked. I saw something pop out of the stump of the tree I'd chopped down. It was sort of a man. Describe him. That's hard. I don't know if I can. He was shortish, and oldish, and brownish, and mossy. And he spoke with a voice that was sharpish and mossy. <coughs> Mister! He said with a sawdusty sneeze, I am the Lorax. I speak for the trees. I speak for the trees, for the trees have no tongues. And I'm asking you, sir, at the top of my lungs, he was very upset as he shouted and puffed, what's that thing you've made out of my truffle tuft? <coughs> Look, Lorax, I said, there's no cause for alarm. I chopped just one tree. I am doing no harm. I'm being quite useful. This thing is a feed. A feed is a fine something that all people need. It's a shirt. It's a sock. It's a glove. It's a hat. But it has other uses. Yes, far beyond that. 
You can use it for carpets, for pillows, for sheets, or curtains, or covers for bicycle seats. The Lorax said, Sir, you are crazy with greed. There is no one on Earth who would buy that fool feed. But the very next minute, I proved he was wrong. For, just at that minute, a chap came along, and he thought that the fee I admitted was great. He happily bought it for three ninety eight. I laughed at the Lorax. You poor stupid guy! You never can tell what some people will buy. I repeat, cried the Lorax. I speak for the trees. I'm busy, I told him. Shut up, if you please. I rushed across the room, and in no time at all, built a radio phone. I put in a quick call. I called all my brothers and uncles and aunts, and I said, Listen here. Here's a wonderful chance for the whole Onesler family to get mighty rich. Get over here fast. Take the road to North Niche. Turn left at Weehawken. Shark right at South Stitch. <laughs> And, in no time at all, in the factory I built, the whole Onesler family was working full tilt. We were all knitting feeds just as busy as bees to the sound of the chopping of truffle trees. <laughs> then, oh, baby, oh, how my business did grow. Now, chopping one tree at a time was too slow. So I quickly invented my Super Axe Hacker, which whacked off four truffle trees at one smacker. We were making feeds four times as fast as before. And that Lorax? He didn't show up anymore. But the next week, he knocked on my new office door. He snapped, I'm the Lorax, who speaks for the trees, which you seem to be chopping as fast as you please. But I'm also in charge of the brown varva loots who played in the shape in their varva loot suits and happily lived eating truffle of fruits. Now, thanks to your hacking my trees to the ground, there's not enough truffle of fruit to go round. And my poor varva loots are all getting the crummies because they have yes and no food in their tummies. <laughs> they loved living here, but I can't let them stay. They'll have to find food. And I hope that they may. Good luck, boys, he cried. And he sent them away. I, the one slur, felt sad as I watched them all go. But business is business. And business must grow, regardless of crummies and tummies, you know. I meant no harm. I most truly did not. But I had to grow bigger. So vigor I got. I vigored my factory. I vigored my roads. I vigored my wagons. I vigored the loads of the feeds I shipped out. I was shipping them forth to the south, to the east, to the west, to the north. I went right on vigoring, selling more feeds. And I vigored my money, which everyone needs. <laughs> then again he came back. I was fixing some pipes when that old nuisance Lorax came back with more gripes. I am the Lorax, he coughed and he whiffed. He sneezed and he snuffled. He snarled. He sniffed. One slur! He cried with a cruffle croak. One slur! You're making such smogulous smoke! My poor swoomy swans! Why, they can't sing a note! No one can sing who has smog in his throat. <laughs> And so, said the Lorax, please pardon my cough, they cannot live here. So I'm sending them off. Where will they go? I don't hopefully know. They may have to fly for a month or a year to escape from the smog you've smogged up around here. What's more, snapped the Lorax. His dander was up. Let me say a few words about Gluppity Glupp. Your machinery chugs on, day and night without stop, making gluppity glup. Also schloppity schlop. And what do you do with this leftover goo? I'll show you. 
You dirty old one slur man, you. You're lumping the pond where the humming fish hum it. No more can they hum, for their eels are all yum it. So I'm sending them off. Oh, their future is dreary. They'll walk on their fins and get woefully weary in search of some water that isn't so smeary. I hear things are just as bad up in Lake Erie. And then I got mad. I got terribly mad. I yelled at the Lorax, now listen here, dead. All you do is yap yap and say, dead. 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 Well, I have my rights, sir, and I'm telling you, I intend to go on doing just what I do. And, for your information, you Lorax, I'm figuring on figuring, and figuring, and figuring, and figuring, turning more truffle trees into thieves, which everyone, everyone, everyone needs. <laughs> And at that very moment, we heard a loud whack. From outside in the fields, came a sickening smack of an axe on a tree. Then we heard the tree fall. The very last truffle tree of them all. No more trees. No more thieves. No more work to be done. So, in no time, my uncles and aunts, everyone, all waved me goodbye. They jumped into my cars, and drove away under the smoke-smothered stars. Now all that was left neath the dead smelling sky, was my big empty factory, the Lorax, and I, the- The Lorax said nothing. Just gave me a glance, just gave me a very sad, sad backward glance, as he lifted himself by the seat of his pants. And I'll never forget the grim look on his face when he heisted himself and took leave of this place through a hole in the smog without leaving a trace. And all that the Lorax left here in this mess was a small pile of rocks with one word. Unless. Whatever that meant, well, I just couldn't guess. That was long, long ago. But each day, since that day, I've sat here and worried, and worried away. Through the years, while my buildings have fallen apart, I've worried about it with all of my heart. But now, says the one slur, now that you're here, the word of the Lorax seems perfectly clear. Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. So, catch. Calls the one slur. He let something fall. It's a truffle seed. It's the last one of all. You're in charge of the last of the truffle seeds. And truffle trees are what everyone needs. Plant a new truffle. Treat it with care. Give it clean water. And feed it with fresh air. Grow a forest. Protect it from axes that hack. Then the Lorax and all of his friends may come back. <coughs> This is the story of how the Grinch stole Christmas. You can read along with me in your book. You'll know when it's time to turn the page when you hear this sound. Let's begin now. Every who down in Mooville like Christmas a lot. But the Grinch, who lived just north of Mooville, did not. The Grinch hated Christmas. The whole Christmas season. Now, please don't ask why. No one quite knows the reason. It could be his head wasn't screwed on just right. It could be, perhaps, that his shoes were too tight. But I think that the most likely reason of all may have been that his heart was two sizes too small. But, whatever the reason, his heart or his shoes, he stood there, on Christmas Eve, hating the who's, staring down from his cave, with a sour, grinchy frown, at the warm, lighted windows below in their town. For he knew every who down in Mooville beneath, was busy now, hanging a mistletoe wreath. And they're hanging their stockings. He snarled with a sneer. Tomorrow is Christmas. It's practically here. 
Then he growled, with his Grinch fingers nervously drumming, I must find some way to stop Christmas from coming. For tomorrow, he knew. All the new girls and boys would wake bright and early. They'd rush for their toys. And then... Oh, the noise! Oh, the noise! 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 That's one thing he hated! The noise! 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 Then the ooze, young and old, would sit down to a feast. And they'd feast. And they'd feast. And they'd feast. 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 They would feast on new pudding and rare new roast beast, which was something the Grinch couldn't stand in the least. And then they do something he liked least of all. Every new down in Mooville, the tall and the small, would stand close together, with Christmas bells ringing, they'd stand hand in hand. And the who's would start singing. They'd sing. And they'd sing. And they'd sing. 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 And the more the Grinch thought of this who Christmas sing, the more the Grinch thought, I must stop this whole thing. Why, for 53 years I've put up with it now. I must stop this Christmas from coming. But how? Then he got an idea. An awful idea. The Grinch got a wonderful, awful idea. I know just what to do. The Grinch left in his throat. And he made a quick Santa Claus hat and a coat. And he chuckled and clucked. What a great Grinchy trick. With this coat and this hat, I look just like Saint Nick. All I need is a reindeer. The Grinch looked around. But, since reindeer are scarce, there was none to be found. Did that stop the old Grinch? No. The Grinch simply said, If I can't find a reindeer, I'll make one instead. So he called his dog, Max. Then he took some red thread, and he tied a big horn on the top of his head. Then he loaded some bags and some old empty sacks on a ramshackle sleigh, and he hitched up old Max. Then the Grinch said, Get up. And the sleigh started down toward the homes where the Who's lay snooze in their town. All their windows were dark. Quiet snow filled the air. All the Who's were all dreaming sweet dreams without care when he came to the first little house on the square. This is stop number one, the old Grinchy Claus hissed, and he climbed to the roof, empty bags in his fist. Then he slid down the chimney. A rather tight pinch. But, if Santa could do it, then so could the Grinch. He got stuck only once, for a moment or two. Then he stuck his head out of the fireplace flue, where the little loose stockings all hung in a row. These stockings, he grinned, are the first things to go. Then he slithered and slunk, with a smile most unpleasant, around the whole room, and he took every present. Top guns, and bicycles, roller skates, drums, checkerboards, tricycles, popcorn, and plums, and he stuffed them in bags. Then the Grinch, very nimbly, stuffed all the bags, one by one, up the chimney. Then he slunk to the ice box. He took the hoot feast. He took the hoot pudding. He took the roast beast. He cleaned out that ice box as quick as a flash. Why, that Grinch even took the last can of hoot ash. Then he stuffed all the food up the chimney with glee. And now... Grinned the Grinch, I will stuff up the tree. And the Grinch grabbed the tree, and he started to shove, when he heard a small sound like the coo of a dove. He turned around fast, and he saw a small who. Little Cindy Lou who, who was not more than two. The Grinch had been caught, 
by this tiny new daughter who got out of bed for a cup of cold water. She stared at the Grinch and said, Santa Claus, why, why are you taking our Christmas tree? Why? <laughs> But, you know, that old Grinch was so smart and so slick, he thought up a lie, and he thought it up quick. Why, my sweet little tot, the fake Santa Claus lied, there's a light on this tree that won't light on one side. So I'm taking it home to my workshop, my dear. I'll fix it up there. Then I'll bring it back here. And his fib fooled the child. Then he patted her head, and he got her a drink and he sent her to bed. And when Cindy Lou who went to bed with her cup, he went to the chimney and stuffed the tree up. <laughs> then the last thing he took was a log for their fire. Then he went up the chimney himself, the old liar. On their walls he left nothing but hooks and some wire. And the one speck of food that he left in the house was a crumb that was even too small for a mouse. <laughs> Then he did the same thing to the other who's houses, leaving crumbs much too small for the other who's mouses. It was quarter past dawn. All the who's still a bed, all the who's still a snooze, when he packed up his sled, packed it up with their presents. The ribbons. The wrappings. The tags. And the tinsel. The trimmings. The trappings. Three thousand feet up. Up the side of Mount Crumpet, he rode with his load to the tip top to dump it. Poo poo to the ooze. He was grinchishly humming. They're finding out now that no Christmas is coming. They're just waking up. I know just what they'll do. Their mouths will hang open a minute or two, then the ooze down in Mooville will all cry hoo hoo. <laughs> That's a noise, grinned the Grinch, that I simply must hear. So he paused, and the Grinch put his hand to his ear, and he did hear a sound rising over the snow. It started in low, then it started to grow. But the sound wasn't sad. Why, the sound sounded merry. It couldn't be so. But it was merry. Very. He stared down at Whoville. The Grinch popped his eyes. Then he shook. What he saw was a shocking surprise. Every who down in Whoville, the tall and the small, was singing. Without any presents at all. He hadn't stopped Christmas from coming. It came. Somehow or other, it came just the same. And the Grinch, with his Grinch feet ice cold in the snow, stood puzzling and puzzling, how could it be so? It came without ribbons. It came without tags. It came without packages, boxes, or bags. And he puzzled three hours, till his puzzler was sore. Then the Grinch thought of something he hadn't before. Maybe Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store. Maybe Christmas, perhaps, means a little bit more. <laughs> And what happened then? Well, in Whoville they say that the Grinch's small heart grew three sizes that day. And the minute his heart didn't feel quite so tight, he whizzed with his load through the bright morning light, and he brought back the toys, and the food for the feast, and he... He himself, the Grinch carved the roast beast. This is the story of Mr. Brown Can Moo, can you? You can read along with me in your book. You'll know when it's time to turn the page when you hear this sound. Let's begin now. Oh, the wonderful things Mr. Brown can do. He can go like a cow. He can go moo, moo. Mr. Brown can do it. How about you? He can go like a bee. Mr. Brown can buzz. How about you? Can you go buzz? 
was. He can go like a cork. Pop. 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 He can go like horse feet. Clop. 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 He can go eek eek. Like a squeaky shoe. He can go like a rooster. Cock a doodle doo. He can go like an owl. Hoo hoo. Hoo hoo. Eek eek. Eek eek. Cock a doodle doo. Hoo hoo. Hoo hoo. How about you? He can go like the ring. Diddle 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 up. Diddle 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 dop dop dop. He can go like a string. Choo choo. Choo choo. Oh, the wonderful things Mr. Brown can do. Moo moo. Buzz buzz. Pop pop pop. Eek eek. Hoo hoo. Clop clop clop. Diddle diddle. Dop dop. Cock a doodle doo. Mr. Brown can do it. How about you? Mr. Brown can. Whisper, whisper. Very soft, very high, like the soft, soft whisper of a butterfly. Maybe you can, too. I think you ought to try. He can go like a horn. Blurp. Blurp, 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 like a big cat drinking. Slurp, slurp, slurp. He can go like a clock. He can tick. He can talk. He can go like a head on a door. Knock, knock. Tick, tock. Tick, tock. Knock, knock, knock. Oh, the wonderful things Mr. Brown can do! Blurp, blurp, slurp, slurp, cock a doodle doo, knock, 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 a hoo, hoo, hoo. He can even sizzle, sizzle. He can do that, too, like an egg in a frying pan. How about you? Mr. Brown is smart, as smart as they come. He can do a hippopotamus chewing gum. Grum, 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 grum. Mr. Brown is so smart, he can even do this. He can even make a noise like a goldfish kiss. Tip. Boom, boom, boom. Mr. Brown is a wonder. Boom, boom, boom. Mr. Brown makes thunder. He makes lightning. Splat, splat, splat. And it's very, very hard to make a noise like that. Oh, the wonderful things Mr. Brown can do. Moo, moo. Buzz, buzz. Pop, pop, pop. Eek, eek. Hoo, hoo, clop, 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 fiddle, fiddle, chop, chop, cock a doodle doo, grum, 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 chew, 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 boom, boom, splat, splat, tick, tick, tock, sizzle, sizzle, blurp, blurp, knock, 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 a slurp and a whisper, and a fish kiss, too. Mr. Brown can do it. How about you? This is the story of Yertle the Turtle from Yertle the Turtle and other stories. You can read along with me in your book. You'll know when it's time to turn the page when you hear this sound. Let's begin now. On the faraway island of Salamasand, Yertle the Turtle was king of the pond. A nice little pond. It was clean. It was neat. The water was warm. There was plenty to eat. 
The turtles had everything turtles might need. And they were all happy. Quite happy indeed. They were, until you know, the king of them all, decided the kingdom he ruled was too small. I'm ruler, said you know, of all that I see. But I don't see enough. That's the trouble with me. With this stone for a throne, I look down on my pond, but I cannot look down on the places beyond. This throne that I sit on is too, too low down. It ought to be higher. He said with a frown. If I could sit high, how much greater I'd be. What a king. I'd be ruler of all I could see. So Yurdal, the turtle king, lifted his hand, and Yurdal, the turtle king, gave a command. He ordered nine turtles to swim to his stone, and, using these turtles, he built a new throne. He made each turtle stand on another one's back, and he piled them all up in a nine turtle stack. And then Yurdal climbed up. He sat down on the pile. What a wonderful view! He could see most a mile. All mine! Yertle cried. Oh, the things I now rule. I'm king of a cow. And I'm king of a mule. I'm king of a house. And, what's more, beyond that, I'm king of a blueberry bush and a cat. I'm Yertle the turtle. Oh, marvelous me. For I am the ruler of all that I see. And all through that morning, he sat there up high, saying over and over, A great king am I! Until long about noon. Then he heard a faint sigh, What's that? Snapped the king, and he looked down the stack. And he saw, at the bottom, a turtle named Mac. Just a part of his throne. And this plain little turtle looked up and he said, Beg your pardon, King Myrtle. I've pains in my back and my shoulders and knees. How long must we stand here, your majesty, please? Silence! The king of the turtles barked back. I'm king, and you're only a turtle named Mac. You stay in your place while I sit here and rule. I'm king of a cow. And I'm king of a mule. I'm king of a house. And a bush. And a cat. But that isn't all. I'll do better than that. My throne shall be higher. His royal voice thundered. So pile up more turtles. I want about two hundred. Turtles. More turtles. He bellowed and brayed. And the turtles way down in the pond were afraid. They trembled. They shook. But they came. They obeyed. From all over the pond, they came swimming by dozens. Whole families of turtles, with uncles and cousins. And all of them stepped on the head of poor Mac. One after another, they climbed up the stack. Then Yertle the turtle was perched up so high, he could see forty miles from his throne in the sky. Hooray! Shouted Yertle. I'm king of the trees. I'm king of the birds. And I'm king of the bees. I'm king of the butterflies. King of the air! Ah, me! What a throne! What a wonderful chair! I'm Yertle the turtle! Oh, marvelous me! For I am the ruler of all that I see! Then again, from below, in the great heavy stack, came a groan from that plain little turtle named Mac. Your Majesty, please. I don't like to complain, but down here below, we are feeling great pain. I know, up on top you are seeing great sights, but down at the bottom we, too, should have rights. We turtles can't stand it. Our shells will all crack. Besides, we need food. We are starving. Groaned Mac. You hush up your mouth. Howled the mighty King Myrtle. You've no right to talk to the world's highest turtle. I rule from the clouds. Over land. Over sea. There's nothing, no, nothing, that's higher than me. But, while he was shouting, he saw with surprise that the moon of the evening was starting to rise up over his head in the darkening skies. What's that? Snorted Yertle. 
Say, what is that thing that dares to be higher than your looking? I shall not allow it. I'll go higher still. I'll build my throne higher. I can and I will. I'll call some more turtles. I'll stack them to him. I need about five, six hundred and seven. But, as you know, the Turtle King lifted his hand and started to order and give the command that plain little turtle below in the stack, that plain little turtle whose name was just Mac, decided he'd taken enough. And he had. And that plain little lad got a little bit mad, and that plain little Mac did a plain little thing. Burp. He burped. And his burp shook the throne of the king. And you're the turtle, the king of the trees, the king of the air and the birds and the bees, the king of a house and a cow and a mule. Well, that was the end of the turtle king's rule. For you're not the king of all Salamas and fell off his high throne and fell plunk in the pond. And today the great you're not that marvelous he is king of the mud. That is all he can see. And the turtles, of course, all the turtles are free. As turtles and maybe all creatures should be. This is the story of cooking with a cat, official cat movie merchandise of 2003. You can read along with me in your book. You'll know when it's time to turn the page when you hear this sound. Let's begin now. Look. Look. The cat wants to cook. Look. A hook. The cat has a cookbook. We need a tin. Which tin will win? The thin tin is best. Put back the rest. We need ham and jam. Lots and lots of pots. We spot the pot. Hot shot into the pot. A pot shot. Not so hot. We take a seat. We start to eat. No, no, no. We do not eat the treat we eat. Do not slop the glop on top. Stop. Stop. Stop that clock. Mop up that clock. Do not drop the mop in clock. We eat the treat. A spot on the pot. Got the pot. Ding. They are done. A meat seat to eat a treat. We eat a meat, a meat, a meat. This treat cannot be beat. This is the story of Dr. Seuss's ABC. You can read along with me in your book. You'll know when it's time to turn the page when you hear this sound. Let's begin now. Big A. Little A. What begins with A? Antony's alligator. A, A, A. Big B, little V, what begins with V? Barber, baby, bubbles, and a bundle V. Big C, little C, what begins with C? Camel on the ceiling. C, C, C. Big D, little D, David, Donald, you dreamed a dozen donuts and a duck dog, too. A, B, C, D, E, E, ear, egg, elephant, E, E, E. Big F, little F, 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 four fluffy feathers on a fifth or fifth or fifth. A, B, C, D, F, G, goat. 
girl. Goo goo goggles. G, G, G. Big H, little H, hungry horse. Hey. Pen in a hat. Hooray. Hooray. Big I, little I, 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 it you is it she. So am I. Big J, little J, what begins with J? Jerry Jordan's jelly jar and jam begin that way. Big K, little K, kitten, kangaroo, chick a kettle, kite in a king's curfew. Big L, little L, little Lola Lock, left leg, lazy lion licks a lollipop. Big M, little M, many mumbling mice are making midnight music in the moonlight. Mighty nice. Big M, little N, what begins with those? Nine new neckties and a nightshirt and a nose. Oh, it's very useful. You use it when you say, Oscar's only ostrich oiled an orange owl today. A, B, C, D, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, M, O, P. Painting pink pajamas. Policeman in a pail. Peter Pepper's puppy. And now Papa's in the pail. Big Q, little Q, what begins with Q? The quick queen of Quincy and her quacking quackaroo. Quack, quack. Big R, little R, Rosie Robin Ross. Rosie's going riding on her red rhinoceros. Big S, little S, Sully Sammy Slip, sipped six sodas and got six sick sick. T, 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 what begins with T? Ten tired turtles on a tuddle tuddle tree. Big U, little U, what begins with U? Uncle Love's umbrella and his underwear, too. Big V, little V, Vera Violet Vin is very, very, very awful on her violin. W, 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 Wooly Waterloo washes Warren Wiggins who is washing Waldo Wu. X is very useful if your name is Nixie Knox. It also comes in handy spelling X and extra fox. Big Y little Y, a yawning yellow yak. Young Yolanda Jorgensen is yelling on his back. A, B, C, D, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, and... Z! Big Z, little Z, what begins with Z? I do. I am a zizzer zizzer zizz as you can plainly see. This is the story of the Sneetches, from the Sneetches and other stories. You can read along with me in your book. You'll know when it's time to turn the page when you hear this sound. Let's begin now. Now, the Star Valley Sneetches have valleys with stars. The Plain Valley Sneetches had none upon stars. Those stars weren't so big. They were really so small, you might think such a thing wouldn't matter at all. But, because they had stars, all the Star Valley Sneetches would brag, we're the best kind of Sneetch on the beaches. With their snoots in the air, they would sniff and they'd snort. We'll have nothing to do with a Plain Valley sort. And whenever they met some, when they were out walking, they'd hike right on past them without even talking. When the Star Valley children went out to play ball, could a Plain Valley get in the game? Not at all. You only could play if your valleys had stars, and the Plain Valley children had none upon stars. 
when the Star Valley speeches had Frankfurter roasts or picnics or parties or marshmallow toasts, they never invited the Plain Valley speeches. They left them out cold in the dark of the beaches. They kept them away. Never let them come near. And that's how they treated them year after year. Then one day, it seems, while the Plain Valley speeches were moping and doping alone on the beaches, just sitting there wishing their bellies had stars, a stranger zipped up in the strangest of cars. My friends, he announced in a voice, clear and keen, my name is Sylvester McMonkey McBean, and I've heard of your troubles. I've heard you're unhappy. But I can fix that. I'm the fix-it-up chappy. I've come here to help you. I have what you need. And my prices are low. And I work at great speed. And my work is 100% guaranteed. <laughs> then, quickly, Sylvester McMonkey McBean put together a very peculiar machine. And he said, you want stars like a Star Valley Sneech? My friends, you can have them for three dollars each. Just pay me your money and I'll write a board. So they clambered inside. Then the big machine roared, and it clunked. And it bunked. And it jerked. And it burked, and it popped them about. But the thing really worked. When the Plain Valley Sneeches popped out, they had stars. They actually did. They had stars upon stars. <laughs> Then they yelled at the ones who had stars at the start. We're exactly like you. You can't tell us apart. We're all just the same now, you snooty old smarties. And now we can go to your Frankfurter parties. Good grief. Groaned the ones who had stars at the first. We're still the best sneeches and they are the worst. But now, how in the world will we know? They all frowned, if which kind is what, or the other way round? Then up came McBean with a very sly wink, and he said, Things are not quite as bad as you think. So you don't know who's who. That is perfectly true. But come with me, friends. Do you know what I'll do? I'll make you, again, the best sneeches on beaches, and all it will cost you is ten dollars each. Belly <laughs> stars are no longer in style, said McBean. What you need is a trip through my star-off machine. This wondrous contraption will take off your stars so you won't look like sneeches who have them on stars. And that handy machine, working very precisely, removed all the stars from their tummies quite nicely. <laughs> then, with snoots in the air, they paraded about, and they opened their beaks and they let out a shout. We know who is who! Now there isn't a doubt. The best kind of sneeches are sneeches without. Then, of course, those with stars all got frightfully mad. To be wearing a star now was frightfully bad. Then, of course, old Sylvester McMonkey McBean invited them into his star-off machine. Then, of course, from then on, as you probably guess, things really got into a horrible mess. <laughs> All the rest of that day, on those wild screaming beaches, the fix-it-up chappy kept fixing up sneeches. Off again. On again. In again. Out again. Through the machines they raced round and about again, changing their stars every minute or two. They kept paying money. They kept running through, until neither the plane nor the star valleys knew whether this one was that one, or that one was this one, or which one was what one, or what one was who. Then, when every last cent of their money was spent, the fix-it-up chappy packed up and he went. And he left as he drove, in his car, up the beach, they never will learn. No. You can't teach the speech. <laughs> but McBean was quite wrong. I'm quite happy to say that the Sneeches got really quite smart on that day, the day they decided that Sneeches are Sneeches, and no kind of Sneech is the best on the beaches. That day, all the Sneeches forgot about stars, and whether they had one or not, upon stars. <laughs> this is the story of Wharton Hatches the Egg. You can read along with me in your book.
You'll know when it's time to turn the page when you hear this sound. Let's begin now. Side mayor, a lazy bird hatching an egg. I'm tired and I'm bored, and I've chinks in my leg from sitting, just sitting here day after day. It's work. How I hate it. I'd much rather play. I'd take a vacation, fly off for a rest, if I could find someone to stay on my nest. If I could find someone, I'd fly away, free. Then Horton, the elephant, passed by her tree. Hello! Called the lazy bird, smiling her best. You've nothing to do and I do need a rest. Would you like to sit on the egg in my nest? The elephant laughed. Why, of all silly things. I haven't feathers and I haven't wings. Me on your egg? Why, that doesn't make sense. Your egg is so small, man, and I'm so dense. Tut, tut, answered Maisie. I know you're not small, but I'm sure you can do it. No trouble at all. Just sit on it softly. You're gentle and kind. Come, be a good fellow. I know you won't mind. I can't, said the elephant. Please, begged the bird. I won't be gone long, sir. I give you my word. I'll hurry right back. Why, I'll never be missed. Very well, said the elephant, since you insist. You want a vacation. Go fly off and take it. I'll sit on your egg and I'll try not to break it. I'll stay and be faithful. I mean what I say. Toodaloo! Sang out Maisie and fluttered away. HMMM. The first thing to do, murmured Horton, let's see. The first thing to do is to prop up this tree and make it much stronger. That has to be done before I get on it. I must wait a ton. Then carefully, tenderly, gently he crept up the trunk to the nest where the little egg slept. Then Horton the elephant smiled. Now that's that. And he sat, and he sat, and he sat, and he sat. And he sat all that day, and he kept the egg warm. And he sat all that night, through a terrible storm. It poured and it lightninged. It thundered. It rumbled. This isn't much fun. The poor elephant grumbled. I wish he'd come back, cause I'm cold and I'm wet. I hope that that Maisie Burr doesn't forget. But Maisie, by this time, was far beyond reach, enjoying the sunshine way off in Palm Beach. And having such fun, such a wonderful rest, decided she'd never go back to her nest. So Horton kept sitting there, day after day. And soon it was autumn. The leaves blew away. And then came the winter, the snow and the sleet. An icicle hung from his trunk and his feet. But Horton kept sitting and said with a sneeze, I'll stay on this egg and I won't let it freeze. I meant what I said, and I said what I meant. An elephant's faithful 100%. So poor Horton sat there the whole winter through. And then came the springtime with troubles anew. His friends gathered round and they shouted with glee. Look! Horton the elephant's up in a tree! They taunted. They teased him. They yelled, How absurd! Old Horton the elephant thinks he's a bird! They left and they left. Then they all ran away. And Horton was lonely. He wanted to play. But he sat on the egg and continued to say, I meant what I said, and I said what I meant. An elephant's faithful 100%. No matter what happens, this egg must be tended. But poor Horton's troubles were far, far from ended. For, while Horton sat there so faithful, so kind, three hunters came sneaking up softly behind. He heard the men's footsteps. 
He turned with a start. Three rifles were aiming right straight at his heart. Did he run? He did not. Horton stayed on that nest. He held his head high, and he threw out his chest. And he looked at the hunters as much as to say, Shoot if you must, but I won't run away. I meant what I said, and I said what I meant. An elephant's faithful 100%. But the men didn't shoot. Much to Orton's surprise, they dropped their three guns, and they stared with white eyes. Look. They all shouted, Can such a thing be? An elephant sitting on top of a tree. It's strange. It's amazing. It's wonderful. No. Don't shoot him. We'll catch him. That's just what we'll do. Let's take him alive. Why, he's terribly funny. We'll sell him back home to a circus for money. And the first thing he knew, they had built a big wagon with ropes on the front for the pullers to drag on. They dug up his tree and they put it inside with Wharton so sad that he practically cried. We're off. The men shouted. And off they all went with Wharton unhappy 100%. Up out of the jungle, up into the sky, up over the mountains 10,000 feet high. Then down, down the mountains, and down to the sea, went the cart with the elephant, egg, nest, and tree. Then out of the wagon, and onto a ship. Out over the ocean, and oh, what a trip. Rolling and tossing and splashed with a spray. And Morton said, day after day after day, I meant what I said, and I said what I meant. But oh, am I seasick? One hundred percent. After lobbing around for two weeks like a cork, they landed at last in the town of New York. All ashore. The men shouted, and down with a lurch, went Horton the elephant, still on his perch, tied onto a ward that could just scarcely hold him. Bump. Horton landed. And then the men sold him. Sold to a circus. Then week after week, they showed him to people at ten cents a peak. They took him to Boston, to Kalamazoo, Chicago, Weehikin and Washington, to, to Dayton, Ohio, St. Paul, Minnesota, to Wichita, Kansas, to Drake, North Dakota. And everywhere thousands of folks flock to see and laugh at the elephant up in a tree. Poor Horton grew sadder the farther he went, but he said as he sat in the hot noisy tent. I meant what I said, and I said what I meant. An elephant's faithful 100%. Then, one day, the circus show happened to reach a town way down south, not so far from Palm Beach. And, dawdling a long way up high in the sky, who, of all people, should chance to fly by, but that old good-for-nothing bird, runaway Maisie, still on vacation and still just as lazy. And, spying the flags and the tents just below, she sang out, What fun! Why, I'll go to the show! And she swooped from the clouds through an open tent door. Good gracious! Just Maisie, I've seen you before. Poor Horton looked up with his face white as chalk. He started to speak, but before he could talk. There rang out the noisiest ear splitting squeaks from the egg that he'd sat on for 51 weeks. A thumping, a humping, a wild life scratching. My egg, shouted Horton. My egg. Why, it's catching. But it's mine. Screamed the bird when she heard the egg crack. The work was all done. Now she wanted it back. It's my egg. She sputtered. You stole it from me. Get off of my nest and get out of my tree. Poor Horton backed down with a sad, heavy heart. But at that very instant, the egg burst apart. 
And out of the pieces of red and white shell from the egg that he'd sat on so long and so well, Horton the elephant saw something whiz. It had ears and a tail and a trunk just like his. And the people came shouting, what's all this about? They looked. And they stared with their eyes popping out. Then they cheered and they cheered and they cheered more and more. They'd never seen anything like it before. My goodness. My gracious. They shouted. My word. It's something brand new. It's an elephant bird. And it should be, it should be, it should be like that. Because Wharton was faithful. He sat and he sat. He meant what he said, and he said what he meant. And they sent him home happy 100%. This is the story of the Zex from the Sneetches and other stories. You can read along with me in your book. You know when it's time to turn the page when you hear this sound. Let's begin now. One day, making tracks in the prairie of Brax, came a north-going Zex and a south-going Zex. And it happened that both of them came to a place where they humped. There they stood, foot to foot, face to face. Look here, now. The north-going Zex said, I say, you are blocking my path. You are right in my way. I'm a north-going Zex and I always go north. Get out of my way, now, and let me go forth. Who's in his way? Snap the south-going Zex. I always go south, making south-going tracks. So you're in my way. And I asked you to move, and let me go south, in my south-going groove. Then the north-going Zex tough his chest up, with pride. I never, he said, take a step to one side. And I'll prove to you that I won't change my ways if I have to keep standing here 59 days. And I'll prove to you, yelled the south-going Zex, that I can stand here in the prairie of Prax for 59 years. For I live by a rule that I learned as a boy that, in south-going school, never budge. That's my rule. Never budge in the least. Not an inch to the west. Not an inch to the east. I'll stay here, not budging. I can and I will, if it makes you and me and the whole world stand still. Well, of course the world didn't stand still. The world grew. In a couple of years, the new highway came through, and they built it right over those two stubborn zacks, and left them there, standing unbudged in their tracks. This is the story of Hop on Pop. You can read along with me in your book. You'll know when it's time to turn the page when you hear this sound. Let's begin now. Up. Up. Up is up. Cup. Up. Up in cup. Up. Cup. Cup on top. Mouse. House. Mouse on house. House. Mouse. House on mouse. All. Tall. We all are tall. All. Small. We all are small. All. Wall. We all play wall. 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 Up on the wall. All. Fall. Fall off the wall. Day. Play. We play all day. Night. Fight. We fight all night. He. Me. He is after me. Him. Jim. Jim is after him. C. V. We see V. C. V. Three. Now we see three. 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 Three fish in a tree. Fish in a tree? How can that be? Red. 
Red. They call me Red. 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 I am in bed. Red, Ned, Ted, Annette in bed. Pat. Pat. They call him Pat. Pat. Saturday, Pat sat on Pat. Pat. Cat. Pat sat on Cat. Pat. Pat. Pat sat on that. No, Pat, no. Don't sit on that. Sad. Dead. Bad. Pad. That is sad. Very, very sad. He had a bad day. What a day that had. Thing. Thing. What is that thing? Thing. Sing. That thing can sing. Son. Long. A long, long son. Goodbye, thing. You sing too long. Walk. Walk. We like to walk. Walk. Talk. We like to talk. Pop. Pop. We like to hop. We like to hop on top of pop. Stop. You must not hop on pop. Mr. Ram. Mrs. Ram. Mr. Ram upside down. Up up. Ram down. Up is down. Where is Ram? Where is Ram? There is Ram. Mr. Ram is out of town. Back. Black. Brown came back. Brown came back with Mr. Black. Snack. Snack. Eat a snack. Eat a snack with brown and black. Jump. Bump. He jumped. He bumped. Fast. Past. He went past fast. Went. Tent. Sent. He went into the tent. I sent him out of the tent. Wet. Get. Two dogs get wet. Help. Yelp. They yelp for help. Hill. Will. Will went uphill. Will. Hill. Still. Will is uphill still. Father. Mother. Sister. Brother. That one is my other brother. My brothers read a little bit. Little words like if and it. My father can read big words, too. Like Constantinople and Timbuktu. Say, say, what does this say? See, he, me, we. Pat, pop, pop. He, three, three, V. Pop, pop, stop. Ask me tomorrow, but not today. This is the story of the care and feeding of a Grinch, written by Scott Staples and illustrated by Brent Galvin. You can read along with me in your book. You'll know when it's time to turn the page when you hear this sound. Let's begin now. I'm Max, I'm the dog, and my job is a cinch. I keep a close eye on my master, the Grinch. We look quite alike, if you see what I mean, only my fur is brownish and its fur is green. I know you are wondering, what does a Grinch eat? A stinky raw onion is his kind of treat. He likes food that's rotten. 
I guess you could say the term for my master is garbage or me. That's me, standing guard just outside of his cave. I am scaring off who's and I have to be brave. Unlike all the who's who like Christmas a lot, my boss on the mountain absolutely, positively, most assuredly, does not. Just where he went wrong, I do not know at all. It could be that his heart is a wee bit too small. He sneaks down to Whoville and likes to play pranks. I have to help out, but he never says thanks. One prank that we pull always works without fail. We hide in the P.O. and mix up the mail. A gal named Cindy once fell down the chute. I made the boss save her. She was kind of cute. The gal missed the stamper by one little inch. That day, Cindy Lou grew quite fond of the Grinch. Like me, that gal knew that my master was good. The Grinch was not evil, just misunderstood. I'm sad to report he was not a success. Too much food, too much noise, and way, way too much stress. Back up at the cave, as the boss sang a song, he dreamed up a scheme. And I, Max, went along. He put on a big suit of red, trimmed with white. He made me wear antlers. We waited for night. We flew down to Whoville upon a great sleigh, and we made us some history that Christmas day. He stole the whose Christmas, yes, lock, stock, and toy. He unstuffed their stockings. It gave him great joy. He came in the night like an evil green breeze, and he snatched all the wreaths and he swiped all the trees. But the hoots fooled the Grinch in a wonderful way as they all came awake on that Grinchiful day. And from upon Mount Crumpet, we really could tell that the spirit of Christmas was still living well. And then out of nowhere, well, what do you know? His shriveled up heart must have started to grow. He gave them their Christmas, he brought it all back, lock, stock, and toy, in a great bulging sack. My boss now keeps Christmas alive in his heart, and I like to think that I played a small part. You have seen for yourself that it's really a cinch to give a dog hug to my master, the Grinch. This is the story of the Big Rag, from Yertle the Turtle and other stories, written by Scott Staples, and illustrated by Brent Calvin. You can read along with me in your book. You'll know when it's time to turn the page when you hear this sound. Let's begin now. The rabbit felt mighty important that day, on top of a hill, in the sun, where he lay. He felt so important up there, on that hill, that he started in ragging, as animals will. And he boasted out loud as he threw out his chest. Of all of the beasts in the world, I'm the best. On land and on sea, even up in the sky, no animal lives who is better than I. What's that? Growled a voice that was terribly gruff. Now why do you say such ridiculous stuff? The rabbit looked down and he saw a big bear. I'm best of the beasts, said the bear. And so there. You're not, snapped the rabbit. I'm better than you. Pooh. The bear snorted. Again I say pooh. You talk mighty big, Mr. Rabbit. That's true. But how can you prove it? Just what can you do? HMMMM, thought the rabbit. Now what can I do? He thought and he thought. Then he finally said, Mr. Bear, do you see these two ears on my head? My ears are so keen and so sharp and so fine, no ears in the world can hear further than mine. Um, the bear grunted. He looked at each ear. You say they are good, said the bear, with a sneer, but how do I know just how far they can hear? I'll prove, said the rabbit, my ears are the best. You sit there and watch me. I'll prove it by test. Then he stiffened his ears till they both stood up high and pointed straight up at the blue of the sky. He stretched his ears open as wide as he could. 
S-H-H-H. I am listening, he said as he stood. He listened so hard that he started to sweat, and the fur on his ears and his forehead got wet. For seven long minutes he stood. Then he stirred, and he said to the bear, Do you know what I heard? Do you see that far mountain? It's ninety miles off. There's a fly on that mountain. I just heard him cough. Now the cough of a fly, sir, is quite hard to hear when he's ninety miles off. But I heard it quite clear. So you see, Greg the Rabbit, it's perfectly true that my ears are the best, so I'm better than you. The bear, for a moment, just sulked as he sat, for he knew that his ears couldn't hear things like that. This rabbit, he thought, made a fool out of me. Now I've got to prove that I'm better than he. So he said to the rabbit, you hear pretty well. You can hear ninety miles. But how far can you smell? I'm the greatest of smellers, he bragged. See my nose? This nose on my face is the finest that grows. My nose can smell anything, both far and near. With my nose I can smell twice as far as you hear. You can't, snapped the rabbit. I can, growled the bear. And he stuck his big nose way up high in the air. He wiggled that nose and he sniffed and he snuffed. He waggled that nose and he whiffed and he whuffed. For more than ten minutes he snuffed and he snuffed. Then he said to the rabbit, I've smelled far enough. All right, said the rabbit. Come on now and tell exactly how far is the smell that you smell. Oh, I'm smelling a very far smell, said the bear. Away past that fly on that mountain out there. I'm smelling past many great mountains beyond 600 miles more to the edge of a pond. And way, way out there, by the pond you can't see, is a very small farm. On the farm is a tree. On the tree is a branch. On the branch is a nest, a very small nest, where two tiny eggs rest. Two hummingbird eggs. Only half an inch long. But my nose, said the bear, is so wonderfully strong, my nose is so good, that I smelled without fail that the egg on the left is a little bit still. And that is a thing that no rabbit can do. So you see, the bear boasted, I'm better than you. My smell is so keen that it just can't be beat. What's that? Called a voice from way down by his feet. The bear and the rabbit looked down at the sound, and they saw an old worm crawling out of the ground. Now, boys, said the worm, you've been bragging a lot. You both think you are great. But I think you are not. You are not half as good as a fellow like me. You hear and you smell. But how far can you see? Now, I'm here to prove to you big boasting guys that your nose and your ears aren't as good as my eyes. And the little old worm cocked his head to one side, and he opened his eyes and he opened them wide. And they looked far away with a strange sort of stare, as if they were burning two holes in the air. The eyes of that worm almost popped from his head. He stared half an hour till his eyelids got red. That's enough! Growled the bear. Tell the rabbit and me, how far did you look and just what did you see? Well, boys, the worm answered, that look that I took was a look that looked further than you'll ever look. I looked across the ocean, way out to Japan. For I can see further than anyone can. There's no one on Earth who has eyesight that's finer. I looked past Japan. Then I looked across China. I looked across Egypt, then took a quick glance across the two countries of Holland and France. Then I looked across England and, also, Brazil. But I didn't stop there. I looked much farther still. And I kept right on looking and looking until I'd looked round the world and right back to this hill. And I saw, on this hill, since my eyes are so keen, the two biggest fools that have ever been seen. And the fools that I saw were none other than you, who seem to have nothing else better to do than sit here and argue who's better than you. Then the little old worm gave his head a small jerk, and he dived in his hole and went back to his work. (laughs) 
This is the story of a little engine that could, written and illustrated by Jeff Watson. You can read along with me in your book. You know when it's time to turn the page when you hear this sound. Let's begin now. Chug, chug, chug. Tough, tough, tough. Ding dong, ding dong. The little train rumbled over the tracks. She was a happy little train. For she had such a jolly load to carry. Her cars were filled full of good things for boys and girls. There were toy animals, giraffes with long necks, teddy bears with almost no necks at all, and even a baby elephant. Then there were dolls, dolls with blue eyes and yellow curls, dolls with... Brown eyes and brown bobbed heads, and the funniest little toy clown you ever saw. And there were cars full of toy engines, airplanes, tops, jackknives, picture puzzles, books, and every kind of thing boys or girls could want. But that was not all. Some of the cars were filled with all sorts of good things for boys and girls to eat. Big golden oranges, red cheeked apples, bottles of creamy milk for their breakfasts, fresh spinach for their dinners, peppermint drops, and lollipops for after meal treats. The little train was carrying all these wonderful things to the good little boys and girls on the other side of the mountain. She puffed along merrily. Then all of a sudden she stopped with a jerk. She simply could not go another inch. She tried and she tried, but her wheels would not turn. What were all those good little boys and girls on the other side of the mountain going to do without the wonderful toys to play with and the good food to eat? Here comes a shiny new engine, said the funny little clown who jumped out of the train. Let us ask him to help us. So all the dolls and toys cried out together. Please, shiny new engine, won't you please pull our train over the mountain? Our engine has broken down, and the boys and girls on the other side won't have any toys to play with or good food to eat unless you help us. But the shiny new engine snorted, I pull you. I am a passenger engine. I have just carried a fine big train over the mountain with more cars than you ever dreamed of. My train had sleeping cars with comfortable berths, a dining car where waiters bring whatever hungry people want to eat, and parlor cars in which people sit in soft armchairs and look out of big plate glass windows. I pull the likes of you. Indeed not. Enough. He steamed to the roundhouse where engines live when they are not busy. How sad the little train and all the dolls and toys felt. Then the little clown called out, the passenger engine is not. The only one in the world. Here is another engine coming, a great big strong one. Let us ask him to help us. The little toy clown waved his flag and the big strong engine came to a stop. Please, oh, please, big engine, cried all the dolls and toys together. Won't you please pull our train over the mountain? Our engine has broken down, and the good little boys and girls. On the other side, won't have any toys to play with or good food to eat unless you help us. But the big strong engine bellowed, I am a freight engine. I have just pulled a big train loaded with big machines over the mountain. These machines print books and newspapers for grown-ups to read. I am a very important engine indeed. I won't pull the likes of you. And the freight engine puffed off. Indignantly to the roundhouse. The little train and all the dolls and toys were very sad. Cheer up, cried the little toy clown. The freight engine is not the only one in the world. Here comes another. He looks very old and tired, but our train is so little, perhaps he can help us. So the little toy clown waved his flag and the dingy, rusty old. Engine stopped. 
Please, kind engine, cried all the dolls and toys together. Won't you please pull our train over the mountain? Our engine has broken down, and the boys and girls on the other side won't have any toys to play with or good food to eat unless you help us. But the rusty old engine sighed, I am so tired. I must rest my weary wheels. I cannot pull even so little a train as yours over the mountain. I cannot. I cannot. I cannot. And off he rumbled to the roundhouse chugging, I cannot. I cannot. I cannot. Then indeed the little train was very, very sad, and the dolls and toys were ready to cry. But the little clown called out, here is another engine coming, a little blue engine, a very little one, maybe she will help us. The very little engine came chug, chugging merrily along. When she saw the toy clown's flag, she stopped quickly. What is the matter, my friends? She asked kindly. Oh, little blue engine, cried the dolls and toys. Will you pull us over the mountain? Our engine has broken down and the good boys and girls on the other side won't have any toys to play with or good food to eat unless you help us. Please, please, help. Us, little blue engine. I'm not very big, said the little blue engine. They use me only for switching trains in the yard. I have never been over the mountain. But we must get over the mountain before the children awake, said all the dolls and the toys. The very little engine looked up and saw the tears in the doll's eyes. And she thought of the good little boys and girls on the other side of the mountain who would not have any toys or good. Food unless she helped. Then she said, I think I can. I think I can. I think I can and she hitched herself to the little train. She tugged and pulled and pulled and tugged and slowly, slowly, slowly they started off. The toy clown jumped aboard and all the dolls and the toy animals began to smile and cheer. Puff, puff, chug, chug, went the little blue engine. I think I can. 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 Up, up, up. Faster and faster and faster and faster the little engine climbed until at last they reached the top of the mountain. Down in the valley lay the city. Hooray, hooray, cried the funny little clown and all the dolls and toys. The good little boys and girls in the city will be happy because you helped us, kind little blue engine. And the little blue engine smiled and seemed to say as she puffed steadily down the mountain. I thought I could. 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 This is the story of one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish, written by Scott Staples and illustrated by Brent Galvin. You can read along with me in your book. You'll know when it's time to turn the page when you hear this sound. Let's begin now. From there to here, from here to there, funny things are everywhere. One fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. Black fish, blue fish, old fish, new fish. This one has a little star. This one has a little car. Say, what a lot of fish there are. Yes, some are red, and some are blue, some are old, and some are new, some are sad, and some are glad, and some are very, very bad. Why are they sad and glad and bad? I do not know. Go ask your dad. Some are thin. And some are fat. The fat one has a yellow hat. From there to here, from here to there, funny things are everywhere. Here are some who like to run. They run for fun in the hot, hot sun. Oh me. Oh my. Oh me. 
Oh my. When a lot of funny things go by. Some have two feet, and some have four. Some have six feet, and some have more. Where do they come from? I can't say. But I bet they have come a long, long way. We see them come. We see them go. Some are fast. And some are slow. Some are high. And some are low. Not one of them is like another. Don't ask us why. Go ask your mother. Say, look at its fingers. One, two, three. How many fingers do I see? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. He has eleven. Eleven. This is something new. I wish I had eleven, too. Unt. 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 Did you ever write a unt? We have a unt with just one unt. But we know a man called Mr. Unt. Mr. Unt has a seven unt unt. So, if you like to go unt. Unt. Just jump on the unt of the unt of the unt. Who am I? My name is Ned. I do not like my little bed. This is no good. This is not right. My feet stick out of bed all night. And when I pull them in, oh, dear. My head sticks out of bed up here. We like our mic. It is made for three. Our mic sits up and back, you see. We like our mic and this is why. Mike does all the work when the hills get high. Hello there, Ned. How do you do? Tell me, tell me what is new. How are things in your little bed? What is new? Please tell me, Ned. I do not like this bed at all. A lot of things have come to call. A cow, a dog, a cat, a mouse. Oh. What a bed. Oh. What else? Oh, dear. Oh, dear. I cannot hear. Will you please come over near? Will you please look in my ear? There must be something there, I fear. Say, look. A bird was in your ear. But he is out. So have no fear. Again your ear can hear, my dear. My hat is old. My teeth are gold. I have a bird I like to hold. My shoe is off. My foot is cold. My shoe is off. My foot is cold. I have a bird I like to hold. My hat is old. My teeth are gold. And now my story is all told. We took a look. We saw a nook. On his head he had a hook. On his hook he had a hook. On his hook was out to cook. We saw him sit and try to cook. He took a look at the hook on the hook. But a nook can't read, so a nook can't cook. So, what good to a nook is a hook cookbook? The moon was out, and we saw some sheep. We saw some sheep take a walk in their sleep. By the light of the moon, by the light of the star, they walked all night from near to far. I would never walk. I would take a car. I do not like this one so well. All he does is yell, yell, yell. I will not have this one about. When he comes in I put him out. This one is quiet as a mouse. I like to have him in the house. At our house, we open cans. We have to open many cans. And that is why we have Zans. A Zans for cans is very good. Have you a Zans for cans? You should. I like to box. How I like to box. So, every day, I box a gox. In yellow socks, I box my gox. I box in yellow gox box socks. It is fun to sing if you sing with a ying. My ying can sing like anything. I sing high and my ying sings low, and we are not too bad, you know.
This one, I think, is called Ink. He likes to ink, he likes to drink. He likes to drink, and drink, and drink. The thing he likes to drink is ink. The ink he likes to drink is pink. He likes to ink and drink pink ink. So, if you have a lot of ink, then you should get ink, I think. Up. 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 I am a up. All I like to do is hop from finger top to finger top. I hop from left to right, and then up. Up. I hop right back again. I like to hop all day and night, from right to left and left to right. Why do I like to hop, hop, hop? I do not know. Go ask your pop. Brush. 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 Comb. 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 Blue hair, it's fun to brush and comb. All girls who like to brush and comb should have a pet like this at home. Who is this pet? Say, he is wet. You never yet met a pet, I bet, as wet as they let this wet pet get. Did you ever fly a kite in bed? Did you ever walk with ten cats on your head? Did you ever milk this kind of cow? Well, we can do it. We know how. If you never did, you should. These things are fun and fun is good. Hello! Hello! Are you there? Hello! I called you up to say hello. I said hello. Can you hear me, Joe? Oh, no. I cannot hear your call. I cannot hear your call at all. This is not good and I know why. A mouse has cut the wire. Goodbye. From here to far, from here to there, funny things are everywhere. These yellow pets are called the Zeds. They have one hair up on their heads. Their hair grows fast, so fast, they say they need a haircut every day. Who am I? My name is Ish. On my hand I have a dish. I have this dish to help me wish. When I wish to make a wish, I wave my hand with a big swish swish. Then I say, I wish for fish. And I get fish right on my dish. So, if you wish to wish a wish, you may swish for fish with my ish wish dish. At our house we play up back. We play a game called Ring the Jack. Would you like to play this game? Come down. We have the only jack in town. Look what we found in the park in the dark. We will take him home. We will call him Clark. He will live at our house. He will grow and grow. Will our mother like this? We don't know. And now, good night. It is time to sleep. So we will sleep with our pet Zeep. Today is gone. Today was fun. Tomorrow is another one. Every day, from here to there, funny things are everywhere. This is the story of Dr. Seuss's sleep book, written by Scott Staples and illustrated by Brent Calvin. You can read along with me in your book. You'll know when it's time to turn the page when you hear this sound. Let's begin now. The news just came in from the county of Czech that a very small bug by the name of Van Vleck is yawning so wide you can look down his neck. This may not seem very important, I know. But it is. So I'm bothering telling you so. A yawn is quite catching, you see. Like a cough. It just takes one yawn to start other yawns off. Now the news has come in that some friends of Van Vleck's are yawning so wide you can look down their necks. At this moment, right now, under seven more noses, great yawns are in blossom. They're blooming like roses. The yawn of that one little bug is still spreading. 
According to latest reports, it is heading across the wide fields, through the sleepy night air, across the whole country toward every which where. And people are gradually starting to say, I feel rather drowsy. I've had quite a day. Creatures are starting to think about rest. Two different long birds are now building their nest. They do it each night. And quite often I wonder how they do this big job without making a blunder. But that is their problem. Not yours. And not mine. The point is, they're going to bed. And that's fine. Sleep thoughts are spreading throughout the whole land. The time for night brushing of teeth is at hand. Up at Herkheimer Falls, where the great river rushes and crashes, down crags and great gargling gushes, the Herkheimer sisters are using their brushes. Those falls are just grand for tooth brushing beneath if you happen to be up that way with your teeth. The news just came in from the castle of Krupp that the lights are all out and the drawbridge is up. And the old drawbridge drawer just said with a yawn, My drawbridge is drawn and it's going to stay drawn till the milkman delivers the milk about dawn. I'm going to bed now. So nobody better come round with a special delivery letter. The number of sleepers is steadily growing. That is where more and more people are going. In Culpeper Springs, in the Stiltwalkers Hall, the Stiltwalker stilts are all stacked on the wall. The Stiltwalker walkers have called it a day. They're all tuckered out and they're snoozing away. This is very big news. It's important to know. And that's why I'm bothering telling you so. Way out in the west, in the town of Merced, the Inkelhorn Monking Club just went to bed. Every horn has been quietly hung on a hook for the night in its own private Inkelhorn nook. All this long, happy day they've been monking about, and the Inkelhorn monkers have monked themselves out. But they'll wake up quite fresh in the morning. And then, they'll start right in Inkelhorn monking again. Everywhere, creatures are falling asleep. The collapsible flint just collapsed in a heap. And, by adding the flint to the others before, I am able to give you the who's asleep score. Right now, 40,404 creatures are happily, deeply in slumber. I think you'll agree that's a whopping fine number. Counting up sleepers? Just how do do it? Really quite simple. There's nothing much to it. We find out how many we learn the amount by an audio tally o tally o count. On a mountain, halfway between Reno and Rome, we have a machine in a plexiglass dome which listens and looks into everyone's home. And whenever it sees a new sleeper go flop, it jiggles and lets a new giggle ball drop. Our chap counts these walls as they plop in a cup. And that's how we know who is down and who's up. Do you talk in your sleep? It's a wonderful sport and I have some news of this sport to report. The world champion sleep talkers, Joe and Mo Redzoff, have just gone to sleep and they're talking their heads off. For 55 years now, each chattering brother has babbled and yabbled all night to the other. They've talked about laws and they've talked about cause. They've talked about cause and they've talked about flaws. They've talked quite a lot about old Santa Claus. And the reason I'm telling you this is because you should take up this sport. It's just fine for the jaws. Do you walk in your sleep? I just had a report of some interesting news of this popular sport. Near Finnegan and Finn, there's a sleepwalking group which not only walks, but it walks a loop. Every night they go miles. Why, they walk to such length they have to keep eating to keep up their strength. So, every so often, one puts down his hoop, stops hooping and does some quick snooping for soup. That's why they are known as the Hoop Soup Snoop Group. Sleepwalking, too, are the curious crandles who sleepwalk on hills with assorted sized candles. 
The Crandalls walk nightly in slumbering peace, in spite of slight burns from the hot dripping grease. The Crandalls wear candles because they walk far, and if they wake up, want to see where they are. Now the news has arrived from the Valley of Vale that a Chippendale Mutt has just bitten his tail, which he does every night before shutting his eyes. Such snipping sounds silly. But, really, it's wise. He has no alarm clock. So this is the way he makes sure that he'll wake at the right time of day. His tail is so long he won't feel any pain till the nip makes the trip and gets up to his ring. In exactly eight hours, the Chippendale Mup will, at last, feel the light and yell, ouch, and wake up. A Mr. and Mrs. J. Carmichael Crocs have just gone to bed near the town of Fort Knox. And they, by the way, have the finest of clocks. I'm not at all sure that I quite quite understand just how the thing works with that one extra hand. But I do know this clock does one very slick trick. It doesn't tick-tock. How it goes is tock-tick. So, with ticks in its talker and talks in its ticker, it saves lots of time and the sleepers sleep quicker. What a fine night for sleeping. From all that I hear, it's the best night for sleeping in many a year. They're even asleep in this why that motel. And people don't usually sleep there too well. The beds are like rocks and, as everyone knows, the sheets are too short. They won't cover your toes. So, if people are actually sleeping in there, it's a great night for sleeping. It must be the air. It's a great night for snores. I just had a report of some boys who are tops in this musical sport. The snortiest snores in all our fair land are Snorter McPhail and his snore a snort band. This band can snore Dixie and Old Swanee River so loud it would make 40 elephants shiver. The loudest of all of the boys is McPhail. He snores with his head in a three-gallon pail. So they snore in a cave 20 miles out of town. If they snored closer in, they would snore the town down. <laughs> Do you know who's asleep out in Funa Laguna? Two very nice Funa Laguna Laguna. We've added them into our who's asleep count, which has grown to a really amazing amount. Exactly 8,808 creatures are sleeping now. Isn't that great? A jet is in bed, and the bed of a jet is the softest of beds in the world, it is said. He makes it from pom-poms he grows on his head. And he's sleeping right now on the softest of fluff, completely exhausted from growing the stuff. The news has come in from the district of Duft that two off are asleep and they're sleeping aloft. And how are they able to sleep off the ground? I'll tell you. I weighed one last week and I found that an oft is so light he weighs minus one pound. A moose is asleep. He is dreaming of moose drinks. A goose is asleep. He is dreaming of goose drinks. That's well and good when a moose dreams of moose juice, and nothing goes wrong when a goose dreams of goose juice. But it isn't too good when a moose and a goose start dreaming they're drinking the other one's juice. Moose juice, not goose juice, is juice for a moose, and goose juice, not moose juice, is juice for a goose. So, when goose gets a mouthful of juices of mooses, and moose gets a mouthful of juices of gooses, they always fall out of their bed screaming screams. So, I'm warning you, now! Never drink in your dreams. Speaking of dreaming, I think you should note that the Bumble Tub Club is now dreaming afloat. Every night they go dreaming down Bumble Tub Creek, except for one night, every third or fourth week, when they stop for repairs. Cause their Bumble Tubs leak. But tonight they're afloat, full of dreams, full of bliss, and that's why I'm bothering telling you this. At the fork of a road, in the Vale of Avod, five-foot-weary salesmen have laid down their load. 
All day they raced round in the heat at top speeds, unsuccessfully trying to sell Zizzard's Oof Seeds, which nobody wants because nobody needs. Tomorrow will come. They'll go back to their chore. They'll start on the road Zizzard's Oofing once more, but tonight they've forgotten their feet are so sore. And that's what the wonderful night time is for. Everywhere, creatures have shut off their voices. They've all gone to bed in the beds of their choices. They're sleeping in bushes. They're sleeping in crannies. Some on their stomachs, and some on their fannies. They're peacefully sleeping in comfortable holes. Some, even, on soft, tufted barber shop poles. The number of sleepers is now past the millions. The number of sleepers is now in the billions. They're sleeping on steps, and on strings, and on floors, in mailboxes, ships, and the keyholes of doors. Every worm on a fish hook is safe for the night. Every fish in the sea is too sleepy to bite. Every whale in the ocean has turned off his spout. Every light between here and far food lives out. And now, adding things up, we are way beyond billions. Our who's asleep score is now up in the zillions. <laughs> 99 zillion, 9 trillion and 2 creatures are sleeping. So, how about you? When you put out your light, then the number will be 99 zillion, 9 trillion and 3. Good night. This is the story of Bartholomew and the Ooblek, written by Scott Staples and illustrated by Brent Galvin. You can read along with me in your book. You know when it's time to turn the page when you hear this sound. Let's begin now. They still talk about it in the kingdom of it as the year the king got angry with the sky. And they still talk about the page boy, Bartholomew Covens. If it hadn't been for Bartholomew Covens, that chain and that sky would have wrecked that little kingdom. Bartholomew had seen the chain get angry many, many times before. But that year, when His Majesty started growling at the sky, Bartholomew Covens just didn't know what to make of it. Yet all that year, the old chain did it. All year long he stared up into the air above his kingdom, muttering and sputtering through his royal whiskers, um. The things that come down from my sky. All spring, when the rain came down, he growled at that. All summer, when the sunshine came down, he growled at that. All autumn, when the fog came down, he growled at that. And that winter, when the snow came down, he started shouting. This snow. This fog. This sunshine. This rain. Ah. These four things that come down from my sky. But, Chinderwoon, Bartholomew tried to calm him. You've always had these same four things come down. That's just the trouble, bellowed the king. Every year the same four things. I'm mighty tired of those old things. I want something new to come down. Something new come down? Bartholomew gasped. That's impossible, your majesty. You just can't have it. Boy, don't you dare tell me what I can or cannot have. Remember, Bartholomew, I am king. I know, sire, said Bartholomew. You rule all the land. And you rule all the people. But even kings can't rule the sky. Can't, eh? His majesty flew into a terrible rage. Well, maybe other kings can't do it, but maybe I'm one king who can. You mark my words, Bartholomew Covens, I will have something new come down. But how to get something new to come down? That was rather hard to think up. And for many days the old king stomped around, trying to figure out some way to do it. Then, finally, late one night, when all the lords and ladies of the palace were fast asleep, just as the king was buttoning his royal nightshirt, he suddenly stopped still. A strange wild light began to shine in his gray green eyes. Why, of course. He began laughing. They can do it for me. Bartholomew Covens, blow my secret whistle. Quick. Call my royal magicians. Your magicians, your majesty. Bartholomew shivered. Oh, no, your majesty. Don't call them. 
You hold your tongue, Bartholomew Cubbins. You do as I command you. Well, my secret whistle. Yes, sire, Bartholomew vowed. But, your majesty, I still think that you may be very sorry. He took the king's secret whistle from its secret hook. He blew a long, low blast down the king's back secret stairway. And a moment later he heard them coming. Up from their musty hole beneath the dungeon, up the empty midnight tunnel to the royal bed chamber tower, came the magicians on their padded, shuffling feet. Up and right into the room they came chanting. Shuffle, tuffle, muzzle, muff. Fista, wista, mista cuff. We are men of groans and owls, mystic men who eat boiled owls. Tell us what you wish, O king, our magic can do anything. I wish, spoke the king, to have you make something fall from my skies that no other kingdom has ever had before. What can you do? What will you make? For a moment they stood thinking, blinking their creaky eyes. Then they spoke a word, one word, Ooblek. Ooblek? Ask the king, what will it look like? Won't look like rain. Won't look like snow. Won't look like fog. That's all we know. We just can't tell you any more. We've never made Ooblek before. They vowed. They started toward the door. We go now to our secret cave on Mystic Mountain Nika Cave. There, all night long, we'll work for you, and you'll have Ooblek when we're through. They'll do something crazy, whispered Bartholomew. Call them back, your majesty. Stop them. Stop them? Not for a ton of diamonds, chuckled the king. Why, I'll be the mightiest man that ever lived. Just think of it. Tomorrow I'm going to have Ooblek. It took Bartholomew a long time to get the excited king to sleep that night. But there was no sleep for Bartholomew, the page boy. All night long he stood in the king's window, staring out at the mystic mountain Nika cave. Somewhere up there, Bartholomew knew the magicians were working their terrible magic. All night the magicians did. All night they walked circles round their magic fire, making magic mumbling with their clucking tongues. Oh, snow and rain are not enough. Oh, we must make some brand new stuff. So feed the fire with wet mouse hair, burn an onion. Burn a chair. Burn a whisker from your chin and burn a long sour lizard skin. Burn yellow twigs and burn red rust and burn a stocking full of dust. Make magic smoke, green, thick and hot. It sure smells dreadful, does it not? That means the smoke is now just right, so, quick. Before the day gets light, go, magic smoke. Go high. Go high. Go rise into the kingdom sky. Go make the Ooblek tumble down on every street in every town. Go make the ones rush Ooblek fall. Oh, bring down Ooblek on us all. Dawn was just breaking and Bartholomew was still standing, trembling, watching at the bed chamber window. But now, as the sun rose, Bartholomew smiled. Those silly magicians hadn't done a thing. Then, suddenly, Bartholomew Coven stopped smiling. Was he seeing things? No. There was something strange up there in the sky. At first it seemed like a little greenish cloud, just a wisp of greenish steam. But now it was coming lower, closer, down toward the fields and farms and houses of the sleeping little kingdom. It was swirling around the topmost turrets of the palace. Tiny little greenish specks were shimmering in the air right over his head. Queer little greenish blobs, just about the size of great seas. He stretched out his hand. He started to catch one. Then he pulled his hand back. There was something frightening about those blobs. Bartholomew slammed the window shut. Wake up, your majesty, he shouted. You're Ooblek. It's fallen. The king sprang out of his royal bed sheets. By my royal whiskers, it is, he cried. Oh, that beautiful Ooblek. And it's mine. All mine. I don't like the looks of those blobs, sire, said Bartholomew. They're coming down now, as big as greenish peanuts. The bigger the better, laughed the king. Oh, what a day! I'm going to make it a holiday. I want every man, woman and child in my kingdom to go out and dance in my glorious Ooblek. Out in that stuff? Asked Bartholomew. Do you really think it's safe, sire? Stop asking foolish questions, snapped the king. Boy, you run through my royal bell tower. Wake my royal bell ringer. 
tell him to ring the great holiday bell. For a moment, Bartholomew Covens didn't move. Run, barked the king. Bartholomew ran. Merciful gracious, he gulped. What is that? All over my bell like creamish molasses. Not only your bell, Bartholomew cried. Look at that poor robin down there in that tree. She's stuck to her nest. She can't move a wing. That oobleck scooby. It's scummy. It's like glue. Oh. The bell ringer wrung his hands. If that green stuff sticks up robins, it'll stick up people, too. Someone's got to warn the people, cried Bartholomew. Got to wake them and warn them to stay inside their houses. I'll tell the royal trumpeter, he shouted. He turned and slid like lightning down the bell tower ladder. <laughs> to the trumpeter's tower raced Bartholomew Covens and on up the steps four stairs at a time. As he ran he could hear the plop, plop of the oobleck on the window panes. It was tilting against the palace walls as big as greenish cupcakes now. He yanked the covers off the snoring trumpeter. He shoved his cold trumpet right into his sleepy hands. Get up. Warn the people. Blow the alarm. Alarm? Yawned the trumpeter. Then his eyes saw the oobleck. Those green things, Bartholomew. Where'd they come from? The king panted Bartholomew. His royal magicians made them. The royal trumpeter leaped from his bed. That king of ours should be ashamed. He jabbed his trumpet out of the window. I blow, he shouted, the loudest alarm that's ever been heard in the kingdom of Did. But all the royal trumpeter blew was a glug. My horn, he gulped. One of those green things flew inside it. He tried to blow it out. He couldn't blow it out. He tried to shake it out. He couldn't shake it out. I'll get it somehow, he yelled. I'll pull it out. No, shouted Bartholomew. Don't you touch it. The trumpeter's hand was already in it. His fingers grabbed hold of a lump of oobleck. He could feel it squiggle around in its fist like a slippery potato dumpling made of rubber. He pulled with all his might. The oobleck began to smash. Then, glowing, the oobleck snapped back inside the trumpet. It yanked his arm back with it right up to the elbow. I can't wiggle a finger, the trumpeter wailed. Oh, Bartholomew, what'll I do? I don't know. And I hate to leave you stuck to your horn. But if you can't warn the people of the kingdom, I've got to find someone who can. Out of the room and down the stairs, race Bartholomew Covens. Down to the chamber of the captain of the guards. The captain was humming in front of his mirror, combing the ends of his handsome mustache. Captain! Do something! shouted Bartholomew. Do something? Why? Smiled the captain. What's wrong? Captain! Haven't you seen the dreadful oobleck? It's coming down now as big as greenish baseballs. Oh, that stuff left the captain. What's so dreadful about that, lad? You know, I think it's rather pretty. Captain! pleaded Bartholomew. It's dangerous. Nonsense! snorted the captain. Lad, are you trying to frighten me? Captains, my boy, are afraid of nothing. That stuff's harmless. I'll show you. I'll eat some. Eat some? Gasped Bartholomew. Oh, no. But before Bartholomew could stop him, the captain was leaning out his window, scooping up some oobleck on the end of his sword. Don't, captain. Don't. The captain did. By the time Bartholomew dragged him back inside the room, his mouth was glued tight shut with oobleck. He tried to speak, but no words came out. All the noble captain of the guards could do was blow a lot of little sticky greenish bubbles. Forgive me for leaving you, captain, said Bartholomew. But a captain full of bubbles is no help at all. Bartholomew stretched the poor man out. He left him there on his chamber floor. Bartholomew went tearing through the zigzag palace hallways. I'll get the king's horse. I'll ride through the country. I'll warn the people of the kingdom myself. He pushed open the door that led out to the royal stables. Bartholomew stopped. He could go no farther. The awful oobleck was plumping down as big as greenish footballs now. Too late to warn the people of the kingdom. 
There were farmers, in the fields, getting stuck to hoes and plows. Goats were getting stuck to ducks. Geese were getting stuck to cows. Outside the palace it was piling up, great greenish tons of oobleck, deeper and deeper, on every roof in the land. There was nothing Bartholomew Covens could do out there. Shaking his head sadly, he stepped back inside. But inside, a moment later, it was just as bad as out. With an angry roar, the oobleck was suddenly hitting the palace harder. It was battering and spattering against the walls as big as greenish buckets full of gooey asparagus soup. Like a sinking sailboat, the whole palace was stringing leaks. The oobleck was ripping the windows right off their hinges. It was dripping through the ceilings. It was rolling down the chimneys. It was coming in everywhere, even through the keyholes. From every bedroom in the palace came the howls of lords and ladies. Frightened in their nightgowns, they came jumping to their doors. Go back to your beds. Get under your blankets. Bartholomew Covens went crying through the halls. But nobody paid the slightest attention. Everyone in the palace started rushing madly about. The royal cook rushed down to the royal kitchen. Bartholomew Covens saw him trapped there, stuck to three stew pots, a teacup and a cat. The royal laundress rushed outside to save her laundry. Bartholomew saw her, stuck tight to the cloth's line, between two woolen stockings and the king's best Sunday blouse. He saw the royal fiddlers. They were stuck to their royal fiddles. Everywhere Bartholomew ran, he saw someone stuck to something. They were stuck up by the dozens. Every last friend he had in the world was flopping and floundering, all hopelessly caught in the goo. Then, suddenly midst the hubbub, Bartholomew asked the king. Where was the king? He'd forgotten all about him. It was in the throne room that Bartholomew found him. There he sat, old King Derwin, proud and mighty ruler of the kingdom of Did, trembling, shaking, helpless as a baby. His royal crown was stuck to his royal head. The seat of his royal pants were stuck to his royal throne. Oobleck was dripping from his royal eyebrows. It was oozing into his royal ears. Fetch my magicians, Bartholomew, he commanded. Make them say some magic words. Make them stop the Oobleck falling. Bartholomew shrugged his shoulders. I can't fetch them, your majesty. Their cave on Mount Anika Tave is very deep in Oobleck. Then I must think of some magic words, groaned the king. Oh, what are those words my magicians say? Shuffle, tuffle, muzzle, muff. That's all I can remember and they don't do any good. The oobleck keeps on falling harder. Bartholomew Covens could hold his tongue no longer. And it's going to keep on falling, he shouted, until your whole great marble palace tumbles down. So don't waste your time saying foolish magic words. You ought to be saying some plain simple words. Simple words? What do you mean, boy? I mean, said Bartholomew, this is all your fault. Now, the least you can do is say the simple words, I'm sorry. No one had ever talked to the king like this before. What? He bellowed. Me. Me say I'm sorry. Kings never say I'm sorry. And I am the mightiest king in all the world. Bartholomew looked the king square in the eye. You may be a mighty king, he said. But you're sitting in Oobleck up to your chin. And so is everyone else in your land. And if you won't even say you're sorry, you're no sort of a king at all. Bartholomew Covens turned his back. He started for the throne room door. But then Bartholomew heard a great, deep sob. The old king was crying. Come back, Bartholomew Covens. You're right. It is all my fault. And I am sorry. Oh, Bartholomew, I'm awfully, awfully sorry. And the moment the king spoke those words, something happened. Maybe there was something magic in those simple words, I'm sorry. Maybe there was something magic in those simple words, it's all my fault. Maybe there was, and maybe there wasn't. But they say that as soon as the old king spoke them, the sun began to shine and fight its way through the storm. They say that all the oobleck that was stuck on all the people and on all the animals of the kingdom of did just simply, quietly melted away. And then, they say, Bartholomew took the old king by the sleeve. and led him up the steps of the high bell tower. 
He put the bell rope into his majesty's royal hands and the king himself rang the holiday bell. Then the king proclaimed a brand new national holiday in honor of the four perfect things that come down from the sky. The king now knew that these four old-fashioned things, the rain, the sunshine, the fog and the snow, were good enough for any king in all the world, especially for him, old King Gerwin of Good. This is the story of Happy Birthday to You, written by Scott Staples, and illustrated by Brent Calvin. You can read along with me in your book. You know when it's time to turn the page when you hear this sound. Let's begin now. I wish we could do what they do in Catrude. They sure know how to say Happy Birthday to you. In Catrude, every year, on the day you were born, they start the day right in the bright early morn, when the birthday log bunker hikes high up Mount Zorn, and lets loose a big blast on the big birthday horn. And the voice of the horn calls, out loud as it plays, wake up! For today is your day of all days! Then, the moment the horn's happy log bunk is heard, comes a fluttering flap flap! And then comes the bird! The great birthday bird! And, so far as I know, Catru is the only place birthday birds grow. This bird has a ring. He's most beautifully ringed with the ringiest bird ring that's ever been trained. He was trained by the most splendid club in this nation, the Catru Happy Birthday Association. And, whether your name is Pete, Polly or Paul, when your birthday comes round, he's in charge of it all. Whether your name is Nate, Nellie or Ned, he knows your address, and he heads for your head. You hear a soft swoosh in the brightening sky. You are not all awake, but you open one eye. Then over the housetops and trees of Catru, you see that bird coming. To you. Just to you. That bird pops right in. You are on your feet. You jump to the window. You meet and you greet with a secret Catru birthday eye sign and shake that only good people with birthdays may make. You do it just so. With each finger and toe. Then the bird says, come on. Brush your teeth and let's go. It's your day of all days. It's the best of the best. So don't waste a minute. Hop to it. Get dressed. And five minutes later, you were having a snack on your way out of town on a smorgasbord's back. Today, left the bird, eat whatever you want. Today, no one tells you you can't or you shan't. And today, you don't have to be tidy or neat. If you wish, you may eat with both hands and both feet. So get in there and munch. Have a big lunch or ooh. Today is your birthday. Today you are you. If we didn't have birthdays, you wouldn't be you. If you'd never been born, well then what would you do? If you'd never been born, well then what would you be? You might be a fish. Or a toad in a tree. You might be a doorknob. Or three baked potatoes. You might be a bag full of hard green tomatoes. Or worse than all that, why, you might be a wasn't. A wasn't has no fun at all. No, he doesn't. A wasn't just isn't. He just isn't present. But you, you are you. And now isn't that pleasant. So we'll go to the top of the toppest blue space, the official catcher birthday sounding off place. Come on. Open your mouth and sound off at the sky. Shout loud at the top of your voice, I am I. Me. I am I. And I may not know why, but I know that I like it. Three cheers. I am I. And now, on this day of all days in Catru, the association has built just for you a railway with very particular boats that are pulled through the air by funicular goats. These goats never slip, never trip, never bundle. They'll take us down fast to the birthday flower jungle. The best sniffing flowers that anyone grows we have grown to be sniffed by your own private nose. They smell like licorice. And cheese. Send 40 who loves up the trees to snip with snippers. Nip with nippers. Clip and clop with clapping clippers. Nip and snip with clipping cloppers. Snip and snop with snipping snoppers. All for you, the who loves clip. Happy birthday. Nop and nip. 
then pile a wondrous smell and stack some 50 hippo hymers decks. They'll take those flowers all home for you. You can keep the hippo hymers too. While this is done, I've got a hunch. It's time to eat our birthday lunch. For birthday luncheons, as a rule, we serve hot dogs rolled on a stool. So stuff and stuff and stuff and stuff and stuff until you've had enough. Now, of course, we're all mustard, so one of the rules is to wash it all off in the mustard off pools, which are very fine warm water mountain top tubs, which were built just for this by the mustard off clubs. Then, out of the water. Sing loud while you dry. Sing loud, I am lucky. Sing loud, I am I. If you've never been born, then you might be an isn't. An isn't has no fun at all. No, he isn't. He never has birthdays, and that isn't pleasant. You have to be born, or you don't get a present. A present? Eh ah! Now what kind shall I give? Why, the kind you'll remember as long as you live. Would you like a fine pet? Well, that's just what you'll get. I'll get you the fanciest pet ever yet. As you see, we have here, in the heart of our nation, the official Catru birthday pet reservation. From east of the east est to west of the west est, we've searched the whole world just to bring you the best est. They come in all sizes, small, medium, tall. If you wish, I will find you the tallest of all. To find who's the tallest, we start with the smallest. We start with the smallest. Then what do we do? We line them all up. Back to back. Two by two. Taller and taller. And, when we are through, we finally will find one who's taller than you. But you have to be smart and keep watching their feet. Because sometimes they stand on their tiptoes and cheat. And so, from the smaller, we stack him up taller. And taller. And taller. And taller and taller. And now... Here's the one who is taller than all her. He's yours. He's all yours. He's the very top tallest. I know you enjoy him. The tallest of all us. I let him ship home to you, Birthday Express. That costs quite a lot. But I couldn't care less. Today is your birthday. Today you are you. So what if it costs me a thousand or two? Today is your birthday. You get what you wish. You also might like a nice time telling fish. So I'll send diver gets, and I'll send diver gets, deep under the sea, in their undersea kits. In all the wide world there are no better pets than the time, tell and fish that gets gets and gets gets. But, speaking of time, why, good gracious alive! That time tell and fish says it's quarter to five. I had no idea it was getting so late. We have to get going. We have a big date. <laughs> And so, as the sunset burns red in the west, comes the night of the day of the best of the best. The night of all nights of all nights in Catru. So, according to rule, what we usually do is saddle up two hooded cloffers named Alice and gallop like mad to the birthday palace. Your big birthday party soon starts to begin in the finest palace you've ever been in. Now this birthday palace, as soon you will see, has exactly 9,403 rooms to play games in. 12 halls for rest stands. Not counting the 53 hamburger stands. And besides all of that, there are 65 rooms just for keeping the sweeping up afterwards rooms. Because, after your party, as well you may guess, it will take 20 days just to sweep up the mess. <laughs> First, we're greeted by drummers, who drum as they come. And next come the strummers, who strum as they come. And the drummers, who drum and strummers, who strum are followed by zummers, who come as they zum. Just look at those zummers. They're sort of like plumbers. They come along humming, with heads in their plumbing, and that makes the music that zummers call zumming. And all of this beautiful zumming and humming and plumbing and strumming and drumming and coming. All of it, all of it, all it's for you. Look. Dr. Deering singing earrings. Deering singing, spelling earrings. See what Deering's earrings do. They sing and spell it. All for you. And here comes your cake. 
cooked by Snookers and Snookers, the official Catru Happy Birthday Cake Cookers. And Snookers and Snookers, I'm happy to say, are the only cake cookers who cook cakes today made of guaranteed, certified strictly green peppermint cucumber sausage taste butter. And the world's finest cake slicers, deader and deader and deader and deader, with hatchets of flutter, high up on the poop deck, stand ready to cut her. Today you are you. That is truer than true. There is no one alive who is youer than you. Shout loud, I am lucky to be what I am. Thank goodness I'm not just a clam or a ham or a dusty old jar of sour gooseberry jam. I am what I am. That's a great thing to be. If I say so myself, happy birthday to me. Now, I horse back and bird back and hiffer back, too. Come your friends. All your friends. From all over Catru. And the birthday pal always eats up with hot friends and your party goes on. On and on till it ends. When it ends, you're much happier, richer and fatter. And the bird flies you home on a very soft platter. So that's what the birthday bird does in cat food. And I wish I could do all these great things for you. This is the story of Wacky Wednesday, written by Scott Staples, illustrated by Brent Calvin, and based on the 1974 Dr. Seuss book of the same name. You can read along with me in your book. You'll know when it's time to turn the page when you hear this sound. Let's begin now. It all began with a shoe on the wall. A shoe on the wall? Shouldn't be there at all. Then I looked up. And I said, oh, man. And that's how Wacky Wednesday began. I looked out the window. And I said, gee, more things were wacky. And I saw three. I went down the hall and I said, hey, three more things were wacky today. In the bathroom, more. In the bathroom, four. I began to dress. Then I said, wow, four more things were wacky now. I looked in the kitchen. I said, I cracky. Five more things are very wacky. I was late for school. I started alone. And I saw that six more things were wrong. And then seven more. And the Sutherland sisters. They looked wacky, too. They said, nothing is wacky around here but you. But look. I yelled. Eight things are wrong here at school. Nothing is wrong, they said. Don't be a fool. I ran into school. I yelled for Miss Pace. Look. Nine things are wacky right here in your class. Nothing is wacky here in my class. Get out. You're the wacky one. Out. Said Miss Pace. I went out the school door. Things were worse than before. I couldn't believe it. Ten wacky things more. Then I count to the eleven. Then, twelve worse things. I got scared. And I ran. I ran and knocked over Patrolman again. I'm sorry, Patrolman. That's all I could say. Don't be sorry, he smiled. It's that kind of a day. But be glad. Wacky Wednesday will soon go away. Only twenty things more will be wacky, he said. Just find them and then you can go back to bed. Wacky Wednesday was gone when I counted them all. And I even got rid of that shoe on the wall. 
This is the story of Ted Apples Up on Top, written by Scott Staples, illustrated by Brent Galvin, and based on the 1961 Theoletic book of the same name. You can read along with me in your book. You know when it's time to turn the page when you hear this sound. Let's begin now. One apple up on top. Two apples up on top. Look, you. I can do it, too. Look. See. I can do three. Three, three, I see. I see. You can do three, but I can do more. You have three, but I have four. Look. See, now. I can hop with four apples up on top. And I can hop up on a tree with four apples up on me. Look here, you two. See here, you two. I can get five on top. Can you? I am so good, I will not stop. Five. Now six. Now seven on top. Seven apples up on top. I am so good they will not drop. Five, six, seven. Fun, fun, fun. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. But, see, we are as good as you. Look. Now we have seven, two. And now, see here. Eight. Eight on top. Eight apples up. Not one will drop. Eight. Eight. And we can skate. Look now. We can skate with eight. But I can do nine. And hop. And drink. You cannot do this, I think. We can. We can. We can do it, too. See here. We are as good as you. We all are very good, I think. With nine, we all can hop and drink. Nine is very good. But then, come on and we will make it ten. Look. Ten apples up on top. We are not going to let them drop. Look out. Look out. I see a mop. I will make the apples fall. Get out. Get out. You. One and all. Come on. Come on. Come down this hall. We must not let our apples fall. Out of our way. We cannot stop. We cannot let our apples drop. This is not good. What will we do? They want to get our apples, too. They will get them if we let them. Come. We cannot let them get them. Look out. The mop. The mop. The mop. You cannot stop our apple fun. Our apples will not drop. Not one. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come all. We have to make the apples fall. They must not get our apples down. Come on. Come on. Get out of town. Apples. Apples up on top. All of this must stop, stop, stop. Now all our fun is going to stop. Our apples all are going to drop. Kaboom. 
Look! An apple and a soul! What fun! We will not let them fall. This is the story of Fidwick the Big Hearted Moose, written by Scott Staples, illustrated by Brent Galvin, and based upon the 1948 Dr. Seuss book of the same title. You can read along with me in your book. You'll know when it's time to turn the page when you hear this sound. Let's begin now. Up at Lake Winnebago, the far northern shore, lives a huge herd of moose, about 60 or more, and they all go around in a big happy hunch, looking for nice tender moose moss to munch. Up at Lake Winnebago, one day, they were lunching, just strolling along and enjoying their munching, for the moose moss, that day was especially fine, when it happened that Fidwick, the last moose in line, saw a vingle bug sitting. The bug called out, hey! It's such a long road and it's such a hot day. Would you mind if I wrote on your horns for a way? Of course not. Smiled Fidwick, the big-hearted moose. I'm happy my antlers can be of some use. There's room there to spare, and I'm happy to share. Be my guest and I hope that you're comfortable there. So the vingle hug picked out a nice easy seat, and the moose went on looking for moose moss to eat. <coughs> Well, an hour or so later, the bug heard a squeak, and he heard the small voice of a tree spider speak. I say, said the spider, you've got a fine place. That moose seems quite friendly, has such a nice face. If I got on, too, do you think he would mind? Hop aboard, laughed the bug. And I think that you'll find that the moose won't object. He's the big-hearted kind. I accept, said the spider, with joy and delight. And he started away on the horn to the right. While the spider was spinning, he heard a gay song, and a fresh little Zinazu bird came along. He stopped. And he started. And he chirped, well, 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 what a smart place to build. What a great place to dwell. I've been living on trees ever since I was born, but here's something new. Why not live on a horn? If there's room there for two, then there's room there for three. There's plenty of room, laughed the bug. And it's free. Fidwick stopped walking. What was all that talking? These guests had caught Fidwick the moose unawares. Hey! He called out. What goes on there upstairs? Just building a nest, sir, the Zinazu said, and began yanking hairs out of poor Fidwick's head. And he plucked out exactly two hundred and four. Don't worry, he laughed. You can always grow more. Then he dozed off to sleep in his fine moose hair nest. This bird, murmured Fidwick, is sort of a pest. But I'm a good sport, so I'll just let him rest, for a host, above all, must be nice to his guest. Besides, now, it's getting quite late in the day, and surely tomorrow they all go away. But, alas! The next morning, the sun's early light brought to Fidwick's sad eyes a most unwelcome sight. Meet my wife, said the bird. I was married last night. And, perhaps, by the way, I should mention to you that your uncle is coming to live with us, too. You're a very fine host, so I knew you'd be willing. <coughs> then the uncle, a woodpecker, started in drilling. All Fidwick's friends shouted, get rid of those pests. I would, but I can't, sobbed poor Fidwick. There, yes. Yes, indeed. His friends answered, and all of them frowned. If those are your guests, we don't want you around. You can't stay with us, cause you're just not our sort. And they all turned their backs and walked off with a snort. Now the big friendless moose walked alone and forlorn, with four great big woodpecker holes in his horn. What holes? Whispered Herman, a squirrel, who spied in. What holes to hide nuts in? H-M-M-M. Mind if I try them? They're yours, called the woodpecker. Get right inside in. This big-hearted moose runs a public hotel. Bring your nuts. Bring your wife. Bring your children as well. So the whole squirrel family all jumped on, pell-mell. <coughs> and the very next thing the poor animal knew, a bobcat and turtle were living there, too. Now what was the big-hearted moose going to do? Well, what would you do if it happened to you? You couldn't say scat, cause that wouldn't be right. You couldn't shout scram. 
cause that isn't polite. A host has to put up with all kinds of pests, for a host, above all, must be nice to his guests. So you try hard to smile, and you try to look sweet, and you go right on looking for moose moss to eat. But now it was winter, and that wasn't easy, for moose moss gets scarce when the weather gets freezy. The food was soon gone on the cold northern shore of Lake Winnebago. There just was no more! And all Fidwick's friends swam away in a bunch to the south of the lake where there's moose moss to munch. He watched the herd leaving. And then Fidwick knew he'd starve if he stayed here. He'd have to go, too. He stepped in the water. Then, oh, what a fuss. Stop, screamed his guests. You can't do this to us. These worms are our home and you've no right to take our home to the far distant side of the lake. Be fair, said Whitbag with a lump in his throat. We're fair, said the bug. We'll decide this by vote. All those in favor of going, say I. All those in favor of staying, say nay. I shouted Fidwick, but when he was done... Nay, they all yelled. He lost 11 to 1. We win, screamed the guests, by a very large score. And poor, starving Fidwick climbed back on the shore. Then, do you know what those pests did? They asked him some more. They asked in a fox, who jumped in from the trees. They asked in some mice, and they asked in some fleas. They asked a big heron, and then, if you please, came a swarm of 362 bees. Poor Fidwick sank down, with a groan, to his knees. And then, then came something that made his heart freeze. Bullets came zinging right past Fidwick's face. Guns were landing all over the place. Get that moose. Get that moose. Fidwick heard a voice call. Fire again and again and shoot straight, one and all. We must get his head for the Harvard Club wall. Fidwick took to his heels with that load on his head. With 500 pounds on his horns, the moose fled. He could have run faster without all those pests, but a host, above all, must be nice to his guests. Up canyon. Off cliff. Over wild rocky trail. With bullets spang bouncing around him like hail. Up gully. Through gulch. And down slippery sluice, with his hard-hearted guests race the soft-hearted moose. Then finally they had him. Because of those pests, he had run out of luck. Because of those guests, on his horns, he was stuck. He gasped. He felt faint. And the whole world grew fuzzy. Fidwick was finished, completely. Or was he? Finished? Not Fidwick. Decidedly not. It's true, he was in a most terrible spot, but now he remembered a thing he forgot. A wonderful something that happens each year, to the horns of all moose and the horns of all deer. Today was the day Fidwick happened to know. That old horns come off so that new ones can grow. And he called to the pests on his horns as he threw him. You wanted my horns, now you're quite welcome to him. He him. They're yours. As for me, I shall take myself to the far distant side of the lake. And he swam with a mango and found his old lunch, and arrived just in time for a wonderful lunch at the south of the lake, where there's moose moss to munch. His old horns today are where you knew they would be. His guests are still on them, all stuffed as they should be. This is the story of If I Ran the Zoo, written by Scott Staples, illustrated by Rent Calvin, and based upon the 1950 Dr. Seuss book of the same title. You can read along with me in your book. You'll know when it's time to turn the page when you hear this sound. Let's begin now. It's a pretty good zoo, said young Gerald McGrew, and the fellow who runs it seems proud of it, too. But if I ran the zoo, said young Gerald McGrew, I'd make a few changes. That's just what I do. The lions and tigers and that kind of stuff they have up here now are not quite good enough. You see things like these in just any old zoo. They're awfully old-fashioned. I want something new. 
So I'd open each cage. I unlock every pen, let the animals go, and start over again. And, somehow or other, I think I could find some beasts of a much more unusual kind. A four-footed lion's not much of a beast. The one in my zoo will have ten feet, at least. Five legs on the left and five more on the right. Then people will stare and they'll say, what a sight. This zookeeper, new keeper Gerald's quite keen. That's the gold darndest lion I ever have seen. My new zoo, Magoo Zoo, will make people talk. My new zoo, Magoo Zoo, will make people gawk at the strangest odd creatures that ever did walk. I'll get, for my zoo, a new sort of hen who roosts in another hen's top knot, and then another one roosts in the top knot of his, and another in his, and another in his, and so forth and upward and onward, gee whiz. But that's just the start. I'll do better than that. They'll see me next day, in my zookeeper's hat, coming into my zoo with an elephant cat. But that's just the start. I'll do better than that. They'll see me next day, in my zookeeper's hat, coming into my zoo with an elephant cat. They'll be so surprised they all swallow their yum. They'll ask, when they see my strange animals come, where do you suppose he gets things like that from? His animals all have such very odd faces. I'll bet he must hunt them in rather odd places. And that's what I'll do, said young Gerald McGrew. If you want to catch a beast you don't see every day, you have to go places quite out of the way. You have to go places no others can get to. You have to get cold and you have to get wet, too. Up past the North Pole, where the frozen winds squeal, I'll go and I'll hunt in my Skeagle Mobile and bring back a family of what do you know? And that's how my new zoo, Magoo Zoo, will grow. I'll hunt in the mountains of Zombamot and with helpers, who all wear their eyes at a slant, and capture a fine fluffy bird, called the Mustard, who only eats custard, with sauce made of mustard. And, also, a very fine beast called the Flustered, who only eats mustard, with sauce made of custard. I'll catch him in caves and I'll catch him in brooks, I'll catch him in crannies, I'll catch him in nooks, that you don't read about in geography books. I'll catch him in countries that no one can spell, like the country of Modifa Potifa Pell. In a country like that, if a hunter is clever, he'll hunt up some beasts that you never saw ever. I load up five boats, with a family of jokes, whose feet are like cows, but wear squirrel skin coats, and sit down like dogs, but have voices like goats, except when they can't sing the very high notes. And then I'll go down to the wilds of Nantucket, and capture a family of lunks in a bucket. Then people will say, now I like, that boy eats. His new zoo, Magoo Zoo, is growing by leaps. He captures them wild and he captures them meek. He captures them slim and he captures them sleek. What do you suppose you will capture next week? I'll capture one tiny. I'll capture one cute. I'll capture a deer that no hunter would shoot. A deer that's so nice he could sleep in your bed if it weren't for those horns that he has on his head. And speaking of horns that are just a bit queer, I'll bring back a very odd family of deer, a father, a mother, two sisters, a brother, whose horns are connected from one to the other, whose horns are so mixed they can't tell them apart, can't tell where they end and can't tell where they start. Each deer's mighty puzzled. He's never yet found if his horns are hers or the other way round. I'll capture them fat and I'll capture them scrawny. I'll capture a scraggle foot mulligatomy, a high-stepping animal fast as the wind, from the blistering sands of the desert of Zind. This beast is the beast that the brave chieftains ride when they want to go fast to find some place to hide. A mulligatomy is fine for my zoo, and so is a chieftain. I'll bring one back, too. In the far western part of southeast North Dakota lives a very fine animal, called the Iota. But I'll capture one who is even much finer in the northeastern west part of South Carolina. When people see him, they will say, Now, by thunder, this new zoo, Magoo Zoo, is really a wonder. Mm -hmm.
Most bees are quite friendly, but still, in some lands, some bees are too dangerous to catch with their hands. For those that are ugly and vicious and mean, I'll build a bad animal catching machine. It's rather expensive to build such a kit, but with it a hunter can never get bit. A zoo should have bugs, so I'll capture a furl whose legs are snarled up in a terrible snarl. And then I'll go out and I'll capture some chugs, some keen shooter, mean shooter, mean shooter bugs. I'll go to the African island of Yurka and bring back a pizzle, top tufted mazurka, a kind of canary with quite a tall throat. His neck is so long, if he swallows a note, for breakfast the first day of April, they say it has to go down such a very long way, that it gets to his stomach the 15th of May. I'll beg a big bug, who is very surprising, a feller who has a propeller, for rising and zooming around, making cross-country hops, from Texas to Boston, with only two stops. Now that sort of thing for a big is just hops. And when I've caught him, then the next thing you know, I'll go and I'll capture a wild tic-tac-toe, with X's that win and with zeros that lose. He'll look mighty good in this zoo of Maroos. I'll bring back a gusset, a gherkin, a gasket, and also a gooch, from the wilds of Nantasket. And eight Persian princes will carry the basket, but what their names are, I don't know. So don't ask it. In a cave, in Khartoum lives a beast called the Natch, that no other hunter's been able to catch. He's hidden for years in his cave, with a pout, and no one's been able to make him come out. But I'll coax him out with a wonderful meal that's cooked by my cooks in my cooker mobile. They'll fix up a dish that is just to his taste, three chicken croquettes, made of library paste, then sprinkled with peanut chucks, pickled and spiced, then baked at 600 degrees, and then iced. It's mighty hard cooking to cook up such feasts, but that's how the new zoo, Magoo Zoo, gets peace. I'll go to the faraway mountains of Tovsk, near the river of Novsk, and I'll bring back a Novsk, a sort of a kind of a thing of Mavovsk, who only eats rhubarb and corn on the Kovsk. Then people will flock to my zoo in the Mavsk. Magoo, they will say, does a wonderful Jovsk. He hunts, with such vim and he hunts, with such vigor, his new zoo, Maru Zoo, gets bigger and bigger. And, speaking of birds, there's the Russian Poluski, whose head ski is red ski and belly is blue ski. I'll get one of them for my zoo ski, Maru ski. Then the whole town will gasp, why, this boy never sleeps. No keeper before ever kept what he keeps. There's no telling what that young fellow will do. And then, just to show them, I'll sail to Katru and bring back a Nitkash, a creep, and a prude, a Nurkle, a nerd, and a seersucker, too. I'll hunt in the jungles of Hippo Novungus and bring back a flock of wild Hippo Novungus. The Hippo Novungus from Hippo Novungus are better than those down in Hippo Novungus and smarter than those out in Hippo Novungus. And that's why I'll catch him in Hippo No Hungus instead of those others in Nungus and Dungus. And people will say when they see these bits bounding, this zookeeper, new keeper's simply astounding. He travels so far that you'd think he would drop. When do you suppose this young fellow will stop? Stop? Well, I should. But I won't stop until I've captured the feet Samawik Samadil, the world's biggest bird, from the island of York, who only eats pine trees and spits out the ark. And boy, when I get him back home to my park, the whole world will say, Young Magruz made his mark. He's built a zoo better than Noah's whole ark. These wonderful, marvelous beasts that he chooses have made him the greatest of all the Magruzes. Wow! They all cheer what this zoo must be worth. It's the goldarnest zoo on the face of the earth. Yes, that's what I do, said young Gerald McGrew. I'd make a few changes if I ran the zoo. This is the story of If I Ran the Circus, written by Scott Staples, illustrated by Brent Calvin, and based upon the 1956 Dr. Seuss book of the same title. You can read along with me in your book.
You know when it's time to turn the page when you hear this sound. Let's begin now. In all the whole town, the most wonderful spot is behind Neelock's store in the big vacant lot. It's just the right spot for my wonderful plans, said young Morris McGurk, if I clean up the cans. Now a fellow like me, said young Morris McGurk, could get rid of this junk with a half hour's work. I could yank up those weeds, and chop down the dead tree, and all off those old cars. There are just two or three, and then the whole place would be ready, you see. All ready to put up the tents for my circus. I think I will call it the Circus Magurkus. The Circus Magurkus. The world's greatest show on the face of the earth or wherever you go. The Circus Magurkus. The cream of the cream. The Circus Magurkus. The Circus Supreme. The Circus Magurkus. Colossal. Stupendous. Astounding. Fantastic. Terrific. Tremendous. I'll bring in my acrobats, jugglers and clowns from a thousand and thirty-three fairway towns to the place that you'll see him in, ladies and gents, right behind Sneelock's store in the Great Magurk Tents. And I don't suppose old Mr. Sneelock will mind when he suddenly has a big circus behind. After all, Mr. Sneelock is one of my friends. He might even help out doing small odds and ends. Doing little odd jobs, he could be of some aid. Such as selling balloons and the pink lemonade. I think 500 gallons will be about right. And then, I'll be ready for opening night. What an opening night. What a night. What a sight. I'll hoist up the curtains. The crowds will crowd in. And my circus madurkus will promptly begin with welcoming food on my welcoming horn, by my horn tooting apes from the jungles of Jorn, where the very best horn tooting apes are all worn, cause the very fresh air there is fine for their lungs. And some of those fellows have two or three tons. This way. Step right in. This way, ladies and gents. My sideshow starts here in the first of my tents. When you see what goes on, you'll say no other circus is half the great circus the Circus Magurkus is. Here on stage one, from the Ocean of Alf, is a sight most amazing. A walrus named Ralph, who can stand on one whisker, this wonderful Ralph, on the top of five walls. Two for tennis, three golf. It's a marvelous trick, if I say so, Mizzelf. And on stage number two, here is something quite new. From a country called From, comes this drum tummied snum, who can drum any tune that you might care to hum. Doesn't hurt him a bit cause his drum tummy snum. And you'll now meet the foon. The remarkable foon who eats sizzling hot pebbles that fall off the moon. And the reason he likes them red hot, it appears, is he greatly enjoys blowing smoke from his ears. Of course, pebbles like this are quite hard to collect, but Sneelock will manage, somehow, I expect. After all, Mr. Sneelock is one of my friends, and I'm sure he'll help out doing small odds and ends. And on stage number four, see the wily Walu who can throw his long tail as a sort of lasso. With a flip of a hip, with a tail of this kind, he can capture whoever is standing behind. He can capture old Sneelock. I'm sure he won't mind. And now here is a hoodwink who winks in his wink hood. Without a good wink hood, a hoodwink can't wink good. And, folks, let me tell you, there's only one circus with wink hooded hoodwinks. The Circus Magurkus. The show of all shows. There's no other showman who shows you a show with a blindfolded woman. The blindfolded woman from Brigger Harut, the world's sharpest sharpshooter. Look at him shoot. Through the holes in four donuts. Two hairs on a worm. And the knees of three birds without making them squirm. And then on through a crab apple up on the head of Sneelock, who likes to help out, as I've said. And now, come to this spot where the spotlight is hot, and you'll see in the spotlight a juggling job who can juggle some stuff you might think he could not. 
such as 22 question marks, which is a lot. Also 44 commas and also one dot. That's the kind of a circus McGurkus I've got. But that's just my sideshow. A start. A beginning. This way to the big tent. You'll find your head spinning. Why, ladies and gentlemen, youngsters and oldsters, your heads will quite likely spin right off your shoulders. So hurry. Step lively. Quick, ladies and gents. And get into your seats in my tent of all tents. My parade of parades is about to commence. You'll see drum major Sneelock Flynn flag is Batman and my organ McClorgan McGurkus come on with its hot steaming pipes of gold brass plated tin, snorting all sorts of snorts in a bundle and in that is super stupendous. Stupendous. Stuorous. And when I play Dixie, please join in the chorus. Then a fluff, muffled truffle will write on a huffle, and next in the line, a fine flummox will shuffle. The flummox will carry a lurch in a tail, and a fiddle will carry the flummox's tail, while on top of the flummox, three harp twanging snarp will twang mighty twangs on their three snarper harp, while a holster blows loops on a three nozzled loser. An holster blows loops on a one nozzled loser. And then comes a lion who's partly a trout. Then more stuff. For 45 minutes, about. And then, behind them, then, while everyone steers. Come my to and fro marchers who march in five layers. The fro's march on toss, and the toss march on fro's. Don't know how they do it, but that's how it goes. And now comes an act of enormous enormous. No former performers perform this performance. This stunt is too grippingly, slippingly frightening. Down from the top of my tent like grease lightning, through pots full of lots of big stickle bush trees, slides a man. What a man. On his roller skate skis. And he'll steer without fear and you'll know at a glance that it's Sneelock. The man who takes chance after chance. And he won't even rip a small hole in his pants. And now here. In this cage is a beast most ferocious, who is known far and wide as the spotted atrocious, who growls, howls and yells the most blood-curdling sounds, and each tooth in his mouth weighs at least sixty pounds, and he chews up, and eats with the greatest of ease, things like carpets and sidewalks and people and trees. But the great Colonel Sneelock is just the right kind of a man who can tame him. I'm sure he won't mind. Then I let Sneelock off for a few minutes rest, while I over your heads you will see the best best of the world's finest, fanciest breezy trap easing. My zoom a zoop trout from West Upper Vent easing, who never quite know why they zoop and they zoom, whether which will catch what one, or who will catch whom, or if who will catch, which I what and just where, or just when and just how in which part of the air. E. E. What a circus. My circus, Murkus. My workers love work. They say, work us. Please work us. We'll work and we'll work up so many surprises, you'd never see half if you had 40 eyes. And now, again Sneelock. Brave Sneelock is back, risking life, on my patented life-risking track, while the speedsters I call my colliding collusions, race round, in swift cars, called abrasion contusions, and Sneelock just lies there. Not one bit excited. I know he won't mind. He'll be simply delighted. And here, in a contest of brute strength and muscle, Kid Sneelock, my champ of all champs, will now tussle and wrestle a beast called the Grizzly Ghastly and slap him around. Then he'll slam him down fastly and pin both his shoulders tight flat to the mat. Kid Sneelock will love it. I'm sure about that. And while that goes on there, look at this go on here. Have you heard of my herd of through horns jumping deer? Every deer jumps through horns of another pell-mell, while his horns are jumped through at the same time as well. By a deer whose horns also are being jumped through, by another who's having his horns jumped through, too, which I'm sure trainer Sneela can train them to do. Then the whole tent will ring with worries and wild shouts, when I wheel in my wheels and they turn on their spouts. 
First my wheel number one, with a name that ends true. Stouts a stout that stouts me up to wheel number two. And then wheel number two stouts is stout like again, and that stout stout solves me up right back to wheel one. And then forwards and backwards, on stout after stout. My great stout writer Sneelock gets stouted about, just as long as the water they're stouting holds out. <laughs> then my tournament nice. No blitz without fears. Sir Hector. Sir Victor. Sir Hoss. And Sir Ears. Sir Hawkins. Sir Dawkins. Sir Jocks. And Sir Jews. Clatter into the tent, and while everyone cheers, stage aroused about joust with their boxing glove spears. <laughs> and while all this wild ruckusing goes on below, at the top of the tent, look. The star of my show. Great Daredevil Sneelock. The world's bravest type. He comes full through the air, like three Snoopian snipe, on the dingus contraption attached to his pipe. And while people below are all turning shock white, and all hiding their fingernails off in their fright, Great Sneelock soars up to a terrible height. <laughs> then he shakes himself loose. He starts down in a dive, such as no man on earth could come out of alive. But he smiles as he falls, and no fear does he feel. His nerves are like iron, his muscles like steel. And he plunges. Down. Down. With his hair still combed neat, 4,692 feet. <laughs> then he'll land in a fish hole. He'll manage just fine. Don't ask how he'll manage. That's his job. Not mine. <laughs> Why? He'll be a hero. Of course he won't mind when he finds that he has a big circus behind. <laughs> This is the story of the footbook, written by Scott Staples, illustrated by Brent Calvin, and based upon the 1968 Dr. Seuss book of the same title. You can read along with me in your book. You'll know when it's time to turn the page when you hear this sound. Let's begin now. Left foot, left foot. Right foot, right. Feet in the morning, feet at night. Left foot, left foot, left foot, right. Wet foot, dry foot. High foot, low foot. Front feet, back feet. Red feet, black feet. Left foot, right foot. Feet, feet, feet. How many, many feet you meet? Slow feet, quick feet, trick feet, sick feet. Up feet, down feet. Here come clown feet. Small feet, big feet. Here come big feet. His feet, her feet. Fuzzy fur feet. In the house and on the street, how many, many feet you meet? Up in the air feet, over a chair feet. More and more feet, 24 feet. Here come more and more, and more feet. Left foot, right foot, feet, feet, feet. Oh, how many feet you meet? This is the story of Scrambled Egg Super, written by Scott Staples, illustrated by Brent Galvin, and based upon the 1953 Dr. Seuss book of the same title. You can read along with me in your book. You'll know when it's time to turn the page when you hear this sound. Let's begin now. I don't like to brag and I don't like to host, said Peter T. Hooper, but speaking of toast, and speaking of kitchens and ketchup and cake, and kettles and stoves and the stuff people bake. Well, I don't like to brag, but I'm telling you, Liz, that speaking of cooks, I'm the best that there is. 
Why, only last Tuesday, when Mother was out, I really cooked something worth talking about. You see, I was sitting here, resting my legs, and I happened to pick up a couple of eggs. And I sort of got thinking, it's sort of a shame, that scrambled eggs always taste always the same. And that's, because ever since goodness knows when, they've always, been made from the eggs of a hen. Just a plain common hen. What a dumb thing to use, with all of the other fine eggs you could choose. And so I decided that, just for a change, I'd scramble a new kind of egg, on the range. Some fine fancy eggs, that no other cook cooks, like the eggs of the ruffle neck salamagooks. A salamagooks Say, they should be good. So I went out and found some, as quick as I could. And while I was hugging them back to the house, I happened to notice a tizzle top grouse in a tree down the street. And I knew, from her looks, that her egg and the egg of the Salamagooks ought to mix mighty well, ought to taste simply super when scrambled together by Peter T. Hooper. So I took those eggs home and I frizzled them up. And I added some sugar, two-thirds of a cup, and a small pinch of pepper and also a pound of horseradish sauce that was sitting around, and also some nuts. Then I tasted the stuff and it tasted quite fine, but not quite fine enough. <laughs> to make the best scramble that's ever been made, a cook has to hook the best eggs ever laid. So I drove to the country, quite rather far out, and I studied the birds that were floating about. I looked with great care at a mock noodle finch. I looked at a beetle, the bald-headed grinch. And, also, I looked at a shade roosting quail, who was roosting right under a lassie lax tail. And I looked at a spritz and a flannel wind jay. But I just didn't stop. I kept right on my way, cause they didn't have eggs. They weren't laying that day. <coughs> then, suddenly. Boy. Up that hill a short space. Birds. They were laying all over the place. Great happy gay families, with uncles and cousins, all laying fine strictly fresh eggs by the dozens. Why, I'd have a scramble more super than super. Scrambled egg super dee duper dee booper, special deluxe all Peter T. Hooper. I picked out the eggs, in a most careful way. I only picked those that I knew were great A. I only took eggs from the very best fowls. So I didn't take eggs from the Twiddler Owls, cause I knew that the eggs of those fellows who twiddle taste sort of like dust from inside of a fiddle. I went for the kind that were mellow and sweet, and the world's sweetest eggs are the eggs of the Tweet, which is due to those very sweet trout which they eat, and those trout. Well, they're sweet cause they only eat wags, and wags, after all, are the world's sweetest frogs, and the reason they're sweet is, whenever they lunch, it's always the world's sweetest bees that they munch, and the reason no bees can be sweeter than these. They only eat blossoms off weasel nut trees, and these weasel nut blossoms are sweeter than sweet, and that's why I nabbed several eggs from the tweet. <coughs> But I passed up the eggs of a bird, called a strudel, who's sort of a stork, but with fur like a poodle. For they say that the eggs of this kind of a stork are gooey like glue and they stick to your fork, and the yolks of these eggs, I am told, taste like fleece, while the whites taste like very old bicycle grease. <coughs> the places I hiked to. The roads that I rambled to find the best eggs that have ever been scrambled. I hunted new birds along wild tangled trails, through gullies and gulches, down dingles and dales. I wriggled my way and I crawled at a creep, through a forest of ferns that was forty miles deep. And I mushed through the brush till I found a fine quigger, whose eggs are as big as a pinhead, no bigger. <coughs> then I went for the eggs of a long-legger quan. Now this quan. Well, she's built just a little bit wrong, for her legs are so terribly, terribly long that she has to lay eggs twenty feet in the air, and they drop, with a plop, to the ground from up there. So unless you can catch them before the eggs crash, you haven't got eggs. You've got one legger hash. <coughs> eggs. I collected three hundred and two. But I needed still more. And I suddenly knew that the job was too big for one fellow to do. 
So I telegraphed north to some friends near Fazol, which is 10 miles or so just beyond the North Pole. And they all of them jumped in their Katamasai, which is sort of a boat made of sea leopard's hide, which they sailed out to sea to go looking for rice, which is sort of a bird, which lays eggs on the ice, which they grabbed with a tool, which is known as a squish, cause those eggs are too cold to be touched without which. And while they were sending those eggs, I got word of a bird that does something that's almost unheard of. It's hard to believe, but this bird, called the pelf, lays eggs that are three times as big as herself. How that pelf ever learned such a difficult trick, I never found out. But I found that egg quick. And I managed to get it down out of the nest and home to the kitchen along with the rest. But I didn't stop then, cause I knew of some ducks, by the name of the single file Zumzi and Zucks, who stroll single file through the mountains of Zums, quite oddly enough, with their eggs on their thumbs, and some fellows in Zum Zoom I happen to know, just happened to capture a thousand or so, and they wrapped up their eggs and they mailed them by air, mark special delivery, handle with care. I needed more helpers. And so for assistance, I called up a fellow named Ollie, long distance, and Ollie, as soon as he hung up the phone, picked up a small basket and started alone to climb the steep crags and the jags of Mount Struku to fetch me the egg of a Mount Struku cuckoo. Now these Mount Struku cuckoos are rather small gals. But these Mount Struku cuckoos have lots of big gals. They dived from the skies with wild cackling shrieks, and they jabbed at his legs and they stabbed at his cheeks with their yammering, clamoring, hammering beaks. But Ollie, brave Ollie, he fought his way through, and he sent me that egg as I knew you would do for my scrambled egg super d duper d duper special deluxe old Peter T. Hooper. In the meanwhile, of course, I was keeping real busy, collecting the eggs of the three eyelash tizzy. They're quite hard to reach, so I wrote on the top of a hammickishnimickishnimickishnop. Then I found a great flock of southwest-facing cranes, and I guess they've got something that's wrong with their brains. For this kind of a crane, when she's guarding her nest, will always stand facing precisely southwest. So to get at those eggs wasn't hard in the least. I came from behind. From precisely northeast. And I captured the egg of a grickly grackless, who lays them up high in a prickly cactus. Then I went for some ziffs. They're exactly like zuffs, but the ziffs live on cliffs and the zuffs live on bluffs. And, seeing how bluffs are exactly like cliffs, it's mighty hard telling the zuffs from the ziffs. But I know that the egg that I got from the bluffs, if it wasn't the ziffs from the cliffs, was a zuffs. Now I needed the egg of a moth watching Sniff, who's a bird who's so big she scares people to death. And this awful big bird. Well, the reason they name her the moth watching Sniff is cause that's how they tame her. She likes watching moths. Sort of quiets her mind. And while she is watching you sneak up behind and you yank out her egg. So I got one, of course, with the help of some friends and a very fast horse. <laughs> If you want to get eggs you can't buy at a store, you have to do things never thought of before. Why, to get at the egg of one very small dog, we had to pry all of one mountain top off. <laughs> then I heard of some birds who lay eggs, if you please, that taste like the air in the holes in Swiss cheese, and they live in big Zanzibar Zanzibar trees. So I ordered a tree full. The job was immense, but I needed those eggs, and said hang the expense. I still needed one more, and I saved it for last. The egg of the frightful bombastic aghast. And that bird is so mean, and that bird is so fast, that I had to escape on a jillica jest. A fleet-footed beast who can run like a deer, but looks sort of different. You steer him by ear. All through with a searching. All through with a looking. I had all I needed. And now for the cooking. I rushed to the kitchen, the place where I'd stack them. I rolled up my sleeves. I unpacked them and cracked them and shook them and shook them in 99 pans. Then I mixed in some beans. I used 55 cans. Then I mixed in some ginger, 9 prunes and 3 figs, and parsley. 
quite sparsely. Just one eat new sprigs. Then I added six cinnamon sticks and a clove, and my scramble was ready to go on the stove. And you know how they tasted? They tasted just like. Well, they tasted exactly, exactly just like. Like scrambled egg super de duper de duper, special deluxe a la Peter T. Hooper. This is the story of I had trouble in getting to Sala Salu, written by Scott Staples, illustrated by Rent Calvin, and based upon the 1965 Dr. Seuss book of the same title. You can read along with me in your book. You know when it's time to turn the page when you hear this sound. Let's begin now. I was real happy and carefree and young, and I lived in a place called the Valley of Vaughn, and nothing, not anything ever went wrong until... Well, one day I was walking along, and I guess I got careless. I guess I got talking at daisies and not looking where I was walking. And that's how it started. Suck. What a shock. I stubbed my big toe on a very hard rock, and I flew through the air, and I went for a sail, and I screamed the main bone in the tip of my tail. Now, I never had ever had troubles before. So I said to myself, I don't want any more. If I watch out for rocks with my eyes straight ahead, I'll keep out of trouble forever, I said. But, watching ahead. Well, it just didn't work. I was watching those rocks. Then I felt a hard jerk, a very fresh green-headed quill and quail, sneaked up from in back and went after my tail. And I learned there are troubles of more than one kind. Some come from ahead, and some come from behind. So I said to myself, now, I'll just have to start to be twice as careful and be twice as smart. I watch out for trouble in front and back sections by aiming my eyeballs in different directions. I found this to be quite a difficult stunt. But now I was safe, both in back and in front. Then new troubles came. From above. And lo! A scratch at my neck. And a scream at my toe. And now I was really in trouble, you know. The rocks. And the quail. And the scratch. And the scrink. I had so many troubles, I just couldn't think. There I was, all completely surrounded by trouble, when a chap rumbled up in a one-wheeler wobble. Young fellow, he said, what has happened to you, has happened to me and to other folks, too. So I'll tell you what I have decided to do. I'm off to the city of Salasalu, on the banks of the beautiful river Wahoo, where they never have troubles. At least, very few. It is not very far. And my camel is strong. He'll get us there fast. So hop on. Come along. I jumped up behind him. Then all through that day, the wobble wobbled on in a wobble some way. The road got more bumpy, more rocky, more tricky. By midnight, I tell you, my stomach felt icky. And so I said, Mister, please, when do we get to that wonderful town? Aren't we almost there yet? Young fellow, he told me, don't start into stew. At sunrise, we'll drive into Salasalu, and you'll have no more troubles. I promise. I do. But, when dawn finally came and the darkness got light, that wonderful city was nowhere in sight. Instead of the city, we ran into trouble. Our camel got sick and he started to bubble. We had to pull him in the one-wheeler wobble. So there, there we were in a dreadful position. Our camel sure needed a camel physician. Now, doctors for camels are not often seen. Especially on mountains. They're far, far between. But we pulled that old wobble and set out to find some doctor while dragging our camel behind. I pulled, pulled and pulled. Then the next thing I knew, I was pulling the camel and wobble chap, too. Now, really? I thought, this is rather unfair. But he said, don't you do. I am doing my share. This is called teamwork. I furnish the brains. You furnish the muscles, the aches and the pains. I'll pick the best roads, tell you just where to go, and we'll find a good doctor more quickly, you know. Then he sat and he worked with his brain and his tongue, and he lost me around just because I was young. 
He told me go left. Then he told me go right. And that's what he told me all day and all night. Next morning we located Dr. Sam Smell, who knew all about tonsils and camels as well. Our camel, he said, had a bad case of leaks and should lie flat in bed for at least 20 weeks. I was tired. Oh, I wanted to crawl in that bed. But the little chap sent me away and he said, your troubles are practically all at an end. Just run down that hill and around the next bend, and you will come to the Happy Way bus route, my friend. The Happy Way bus leaves at 4.42 and will take you directly to Salasalu on the banks of the beautiful River Wahoo, where they never have troubles. At least, very few. Well, the bus stop was there. And that part was just fine. But hacked on the stick was a very small sign saying, Notice to passengers using our line, we are sorry to say that our driver, Butch Myers, ran over four nails and has punctured all tires. So, until further notice, the 442 cannot possibly take you to Salasalu. But I wish you a most pleasant journey by feet. Signed, Bus Line President, Horace P. Sweet. So I went on my feet, thanks to Horace P. Sweet. And that Horace P. Sweet almost ruined my feet. A hundred miles later, my feet were so sore. Then, wouldn't you know it? It started to pour. I was drenched to the skin when a chap in a slicker splashed up and yelled, It's the midwinter jicker. The midwinter jicker came early this year, and it's not going to be very comfy round here. Any fool would get out. So I've packed up my things, and I'm off to my granddaddy's out in Palm Springs. Take cover, he yelled. Use my house, if you wish. Then the chap in the slicker splashed off like a fish. I ran in the house and I fell in a heap. I needed my rest, but I just couldn't sleep. Did you ever sleep when your feet were like ice, with a family of owls and a family of mice? I listened all night to the growls and the yowls, and the chattering teeth of those mice and those owls, while the midwinter jicker howled horrible owls. I tossed and I flipped and I flopped and I flipped. It was quarter past five when I finally slept. Then I dreamed I was sleeping on billowy pillows of soft silk and satin marshmallow stuffed pillows. I dreamed I was sleeping in Salasalu on the banks of the beautiful River Wahoo where they never have troubles. At least, very few. Then I woke up, and it just wasn't true. I was crashing downhill in a floodless flood, with suds in my eyes and my mouth full of mud, and my nose full of water, my ears full of shrieks, of the owls flying off with a mice on their beaks. And I said to myself, now I really don't see why troubles like this have to happen to me. I floated twelve days without toothpaste or soap. I practically almost had given up hope when someone up high shouted, Here, catch the rope. Then I knew that my troubles had come to an end, and I climbed up the rope, calling, Thank you, my friend. I got to the top, but it wasn't a friend, and I saw that my troubles were not at an end. A big man on a horse scared me out of my wits. He bellowed, I'm General Genghis Khan Schmitz. There's a war going on. And it's time that you knew every lad in this land has his duty to do. We're marching to battle. We need you, my boy. We're about to attack. We're about to destroy the perilous cruiser of Pompelmo's Pass. So, get into line. You're a private, first class. He gave me a shooter and one little bean, which was not very much, if you see what I mean. Then he yelled, get that cruiser. Attack without fear. The glorious moment of victory is near. And the glorious general led the advance, with a glorious swish of his sword and his lance and a glorious clank of his tin-plated pants. Then we went round the corner and found that, alas, there was more than one cruiser in Tom Pelmer's pass. And Genghis Khan Schmitz shouted out to his men, This happens in war every now and again. Sometimes you are winners. Sometimes you are losers. We never can win against so many cruisers, and so I suggest that it's time to retreat. And the army raced off on its tin-plated feet. There I was. With more cruisers than I'd ever seen. There I was. 
with my shooter and only one beam. There I was. And I thought, will I ever get through to the wonderful city of Salasalu, on the banks of the beautiful river Wahoo, where they never have troubles, at least very few? I had terrible trouble in staying alive. Then I saw an old pipe that said, vent number five. I didn't have time to find out what that meant, but the vent had a hole. And the holes where I went. Well, that vent where I went was a sort of a funnel that led me down into a frightful black tunnel. The traffic down there was a mess, I must say, with billions of birds going all the wrong way. They lumped me with likes and they banged me with dishes. I ran into ladders, beds, bottles and fishes. I skidded on garbage. I fell in a horn. Troubles. I wish I had never been born. I was down there three days in that bird filled up place. At least 8,000 times, I fell smack on my face. I injured three fingers, both thumbs and both lips, my shin bone, my backbone, my wish bone and hips. What's more, I was starved. I had nothing to eat. And damp. Was it damp? I grew moss on my feet. Then, just when I thought I could stand it no more, by chance I discovered a tiny trap door. I popped my head out. The great sky was sky blue, and I knew, from the flowers, I'd finally come through to the banks of the beautiful river Wahoo. I couldn't be far, now, from Salasalu. There it was, with its glittering towers in the air. I'd made it. I'd done it. At last I was there. And I knew that I'd left all my troubles behind when a shot at a doorway that shimmered and shined waved me away that was friendly and kind. Welcome, he said as he gave me his hand. Welcome, my son, to this beautiful land. Welcome to sweet, sunny Salasalu, where we never have troubles. At least very few. As a matter of fact, we have only just one. Imagine! Just one little trouble, my son. And this one little trouble, as you will now see, is this one little trouble I have with this key. There is only one door into Salasalu, and we have a key slapping slipper. We do. This troublesome slipper moved into my door two weeks ago Tuesday at quarter to four. Since then, I can't open this door anymore. And I can't kill the slipper. It's very bad luck to kill any slipper, and that's why we're stuck, and why no one gets in and the town's gone to pot. It's a terrible state of affairs, is it not? And so, said the doorman of Salasalu, my job at the door here is finished. I'm through. And I'll tell you what I have decided to do. I'm leaving, he said, leaving Salasalu, on the banks of the beautiful river Wahoo, where we never have troubles, at least very few. And I'm off to the city of Wool of Wool, on the banks of the beautiful river Wool, where they never have troubles. No troubles at all. Come on along with me, he said as he ran, and you'll never have any more troubles, young man. I'd have no more troubles. That's what the man said. So I started to go. But I didn't. Instead, I did some quick thinking inside of my head. Then I started back home, to the Valley of Fun. I know I'll have troubles. I'll, maybe, get stunned. I'll always have troubles. I'll, maybe, get bit by that green-headed quail on the place where I sit. But I've bought a big hat. I'm all ready, you see. Now my troubles are going to have troubles with me.